What is up guys? Welcome back to yet another Trek, the Mushoku Tensei Jobless Reincarnation novel series. Happy Mushoku Mondays. I almost forgot again. We are on volume 10, chapter 11. I am officially completed with volume 10 at this point. I'm hoping to complete volume 10 in this Mushoku Mondays, but as per usual, we'll see how things go. There is a there's a lot to really digest in these last few chapters. It's kind of nice and refreshing after, again, like I've said before, not my favorite volume ever. But I think the last four chapters of this particular volume are super juicy. So we'll see. I kind of pushed myself a little too hard last week trying to get that one done. And it was like an hour and 50 minutes. I don't know that I want to do that again. <laughs> I kind of need to settle back down because I'm pushing myself too much. But, but I'm excited to get into volume 11, of course, and continue on into the big volumes that everybody keeps mentioning. <laughs> so we'll see. As per usual, thank you everybody in the premiere chat. Thanks for dropping by for all your support. It means a lot to me. All those that are hitting the like button right now, all those that subscribe to the channel, all those support through memberships, super thanks, all that stuff. It means a great deal to me. It's your guys' support that keeps this going. And the feedback and the appreciation is just fantastic. So with that said, let's jump into chapter 11 of volume 10. Three heads are better than one. A week has passed since Nanahoshi has been under their protection. And the worst seemed to have passed. She was eating a little and taking baths whenever they requested her to. The ambitions that Rudius had once seen in her was gone. All that was left was resignation. Rudius never experienced something like what she went through. Yes, the worst they can really come up with was this one time he spent several years no lifing a video game only to be banned. He protested the management only to cry himself to sleep. He spent a whole month unmotivated and swore to never invest in online games again. But Nanahoshi was different. Her objective was to return home. If she gave up on that, Rudius was afraid she'd give up on living. Again, like I mentioned in the last Mishiko Monday, I like this aspect of understanding somebody, but not really. This idea of being very careful about saying that you understand what somebody's going through. When, as he mentions here, the worst I can come up with was this one time I devoted several years to this one game, and then it kind of fell apart. I've kind of experienced that myself, investing in online games, and only to either just lose interest or it to shut down. Press this connect. <laughs> Of course, he tried to encourage her, but she was always in a daze the whole time. I thought I'd covered everything. A magic circle is basically what we would call a circuit board in our world. You create a single function by combining several circuit patterns. However, one part would not connect. No matter what I did, no matter how I changed the wiring, one part wouldn't connect with the rest. I tried forcing it, but then the defect would appear elsewhere. Rudis went on to explain that in order to fix this, she nearly doubled the size of it. To compensate for the resulting distortion, she patched another circuit. Still, that one defect would remain in her circle. She could overcome this one section, but then it wouldn't connect. She couldn't overcome that one section that wouldn't connect. Again, she's kind of like, just like building around it and building around it and going all around. <laughs> He's creating, creating all these different like highways around it, but each one of them, the, the road would just snap. It's physically impossible. That means there's no way for me to return home. The magic circle that she had put together was years of painstaking work. At a glance, it seemed like a problem ultimately solvable, if tremendously complicated, but the mysterious defect suggested otherwise. At this point, what she said jogged something in Rudius's memory, so he decided to go to the research lab. He brought along Cliff and Zenoba, and for some reason, Ellen Elise came with Cliff. Ellen Elise spoke up. It's hard to believe that someone like Silent is in that kind of state. It just seemed like she was made of tougher stuff. But Rudius replied, truly strong people don't close themselves off from the world and bear all their burdens on their own. <laughs> Bold words coming from you, Rudius. Bold words coming from you. But again, he's sort of speaking from experience. Well, I suppose that's true. Being as Elise was skilled at handling younger women, he considered enlisting her help to get Nanahoshi to take a breather. Again, this goes back to Rudius's kind of misconceptions of Elise. He assumed that she looked down upon the women, but she was actually giving them a lot of advice. And we've seen that with Roxy as well, and technically Zenith. Now then, the two of you. First, take a look at this. Cliff spoke up. That's a messy circle. There's messy and neat circles? Of course there are. You have to keep your circles neat and small when creating magical implements. I could have drawn this much more neatly. For instance, if you connect this part here over this part over here, you could make it much cleaner. Mm hmm Rudius figured it was easy to critique someone's work, but if they did as Cliff proposed, it may create defects in the circle. Again, <laughs> 
Nanohoshi's been working on this for a long time. She's probably thought of, oh, I'll just correct this. I can just imagine if Nanahoshi was in the room and he said that, she'd be like, yeah, sure, let's try that. Uh-huh. Yeah, what do you think? <laughs> ah, but the idea is amazing. I never think to loop this part right here. Oh, I see. The reason why this part is complex is because of this here. This here, that there. Maybe, maybe I can make sense of it if I paid more attention to my theory. So, master, what kind of circle is this? This is what Silent was studying, summoning circles. But she's gotten a little stuck, so I wanted to get your guys' input to help her. But summoning circles is out of our realm of expertise, is it not? Well, if we can't solve the problem, so be it. Reese figured that each one of them had different fields of expertise, and in possibly bringing them all together might be able to find some sort of alternative approach for Nanahoshi to really look at, something that she hadn't seen. Which is kind of interesting. It's always nice whenever you're running into a problem, despite the fact that some people might not understand what you're working on, they might be able to go, well, it, this looks off. And you're like, oh, you're right, that is off. Like, I'm not a big mechanic, but if I was, you know, helping somebody and they're working on an engine and they can't figure it out, and I go, hey, why isn't this plugged in right here? They could go, that's not plugged in for a reason, move away. Or they can go, shoot, I forgot about that. <laughs> Anyways. Please look at this section. This is apparently where the circle disconnected, see? He pointed out the spot where there's a tear in the paper that appeared during the experiment. This is where it disconnected? I didn't even notice it. This circle is incomplete then. Um, so the part that this should connect to is here. Do you have any ideas on how to connect the circuit? Cliff pondered before jotting on his memo pad. Wouldn't it work if you use multi-level structures? A multi-level structure? What are you talking about? With the doll I'm researching, there are several layers of magical circles combined together to produce a single effect. That said, I have only just begun my research, so I've never ever drawn a proper circle yet myself. But, wait, doll? You mean the one from before? Let me see it. Master, is it all right with you? Yeah, of course. Zenoba then fetched a sliver of the doll's arm for Cliff to study. Mm, I have no idea what the mechanics behind this are. Are these two magic circles? One on top of each other? No, that's not it. There's more to it than that. It couldn't move properly without all of them together, but it was still able to move even though it was broken. Damn it, what the hell's with the circle? <laughs> I can just see Cliff just trying to look like a genius and he just can't figure it out. Cliff grinded his teeth just like Vegeta, angry at Goku's power level being over 9,000. I don't know the details yet myself, but according to the book, this circle apparently controls the movement of the elbow. Zenoba answered so casually that Cliff looked like he might burst in tears. <laughs> I can't, Cliff can't figure it out, and it's so foreign to him, and he wants to understand it. And then Zenoba's like, well, I looked at this thing, and it just happened. Ellen only seeing this, rushed over and put his head inside of her chest and started rubbing his head. There, there, you're a genius yourself, Cliff. You would have been just as knowledgeable if you researched the matter yourself. Uh, I, I, I know that. Master Cliff, if we use the same technique that was used for the doll, do you think we'd be able to solve this problem? No clue, but it's worth a shot. Rudius knew that this was a lead at least. Nanahoshi only drew single layers. However, there was a chance that there was a reason why she hadn't done it. He's not gonna assume that she hasn't tried to do multi-layers. It might be possibly that she's seen it at some point and said, no, when you do that, it causes this problem. So that's out of the question. But there was hope that this would inspire her again. The next day, Rudius brought Nanahoshi to the research room. He spent the day before putting everything in order somewhat. Zenoba and Cliff were waiting for them. What's this? Did you bring me here so that you can ravish me? <laughs> He had plenty of opportunities to do that, Nanahoshi, technically. Cliff spoke up. How dare you? I'm a devout follower of Millis. If you say so. Master Cliff, Zenoba, let's just talk about what we came up with yesterday. Nanahoshi listened with disinterest as Rudius went through all the corrections that Cliff proposed. Then he talked about Zenoba's proposal for multi-leveled structures. Then, Rudius's idea for the three-dimensional circles. She was perfectly still. When his eyes met her, she was expressionless, concentrating. That might work. She leapt up. That's it. That was it. That's what it is. There was no reason for me to get so caught up in drawing on a flat surface. That makes sense, of course. Putting it on paper will provide depth. If I layered those papers, I can make as big of a magic circle as I want. Why couldn't I think of this simple thing so much sooner? She paced around. Then she took a pen and began to draw. She raced, then she drew again. Cliff then interjected, which Rudius thought was gonna cause a fire. <laughs> However, she committed him calling him clever. They were working together, shoulder to shoulder. Cliff was truly amazing. Only recently just begun researching circles himself. At any rate, Nanahoshi was in good spirits. Even if she didn't succeed this time, she had a foothold once more. A reason 
for hope. Rius then decided to go get Ellen and Elise. <laughs> she, <laughs> Ellen and Elise wouldn't like the idea of the two of them getting cozy while she wasn't there. As Rius left, he could hear excitement in Nanahoshi's voice for the first time. The first time. Not again, the first time. She's always been like this grumpy, grouchy girl just stuck in her research. I mean, you, you might have gotten a little bit of excitement out of her back when she first realized that he was another isekai, but this is excitement, like true excitement. And it all took the idea of just kind of thinking third dimension, essentially. She was thinking two dimension with just a flat surface, draw it in one dimension, now it's going to multiple layers, which technically makes sense to the circuit boardery that she was talking about and the idea of like, you know, daughter cards and stuff like that. A week later, Nanahoshi completed her magic circle. The end result was five layers of paper glued together like cardboard. Zenoba and Cliff looked on as Rudius poured mana into it. A light grew in the middle before something formed, something from another world. It was a successful summon, a plastic bottle. <laughs> no cap, no label, just a simple plastic bottle. There you go. <laughs> Some poor guy is biking down the road and suddenly sploosh and a cap hits the ground behind him. And he's like, what? <laughs> and that guy dehydrated because he was in the middle of a biking trail and he's thirsty and he was just about to grab that bottle. And now he collapsed of dehydration. I like the fact that it notes later on that Cliff is looking at this thing and he's just crumpling. <laughs> like, it's, what is noise? What is this thing doing? Like a dog or a kid just kind of messing with the noise. Oh, most impressive. What the heck is this? Glass? No, it's, it's softer than glass. Zenoba and Cliff couldn't hide their excitement at seeing a plastic bottle for the first time. And Elise and Julie also peered at it with interest. And Hoshi clenched her fist and let out a barely audible, yes, I did it. A plastic bottle, insignificant and significant at the same time. Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt here. It's like, yes, it's just a plastic bottle, but what it, the travels it went through, <laughs> the travels it went through to get here, that's the accomplishment. For a brief moment, this world was connected to their last. I would argue here, and I don't know if this is going to turn into a thing later. And again, chat, you don't have to chat. No. Is it? <laughs> That's my big question mark. Was it your world? Or was it a similar world? Yeah, there might be multiple worlds with plastic bottles. There's obviously there's things in this world. There's chairs, there's thrones, there's cushions. There's things in this world of Mishiko Tensei that is in our world. So what's to say there's not another world that has plastic bottles? But that's probably going in some weird <laughs> side tangent. You succeeded. Yes, I did. Now I can finally move on to my next step. As I probe deeper in the layer of magic circles, I should be able to summon just about anything. If I can organize the circle better, then by just changing out two or three layers, I can most likely... She then suddenly averted her eyes. Sorry for, for causing you so much trouble. It's a give and take, right? The next time I'm in a bind, lend me a hand, okay? I'd, I'd already planned on that. I'd be like, and uh, can you tell Orsted to never lay a hand on me again? <laughs> can you put a good word in for <laughs> Orsted for me? You two are so close, huh? You're always quick to assume a love affair. Ella and Lisa had a look of a reproachful mother-in-law. <laughs> Ella and Lisa's looking out for Sylphie. She's like, you better not be going after anybody <laughs> against my granddaughter's wishes. Nanahoshi gave some distance between them, noting how it would be bad if it was misunderstood. But Ella and Lisa laughed cheerfully and wrapped her arms around Nanahoshi. There's no need for you to worry over that. Ah, oh, I know. Let's go to the pub today. It'll be your treat, of course. I guess I have no choice, but that makes me even with all of you. Sounds wonderful. Wouldn't you agree, Cliff? Cliff, who was crumpling up the plastic bottle in his hands, <laughs> spoke up. Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, that makes us even. But you're pretty exceptional yourself, so I wouldn't mind you helping me out with my own research sometime. They all headed out, and along the way, they were joined by Linnea, Persena, Bodigati, and Sylphie, thanks to Ariel allowing her to go. At the pub, Nanahoshi attempted to reserve the entire place with Badigati throwing in another bag of gold to sweeten the dill. Wah! It's a day of celebration. Let all those who come this day enjoy their alcohol free of charge. As he ordered everything on the menu, Badigati spoke up again. Now then, what are we celebrating today? <laughs> it's like he's walking by and they're like, hey, we're going to celebrate Badigati. And he's like, wah, I'll come too. And then they get in there and he's just like, all right, celebration time. Order everything on the menu. So what are we celebrating? <laughs> I love Buddy Gotti. He's just like, whatever, an excuse to celebrate. What are we doing this time? 
He don't care. The success of Silent's research. All right, well then, Silent, stand up. You must give your speech. She looked reluctant, but then she stated, thanks for today. Okay, now, cheers. <laughs> I love body gotti. I love body gotti. The party was enjoyable. When good things happened, people made merry and drank. Rudius never really did this in his previous life and only a couple times in this one. But after internally criticizing the loudness and drunkenness of it all, he now understood how people felt. Being in the fray himself now, sometimes he thought you just needed to let loose and have fun. Me personally, I'm not a drinking person, so I don't really necessarily drink in order to do that, but I definitely agree here. Sometimes you just have to be merry. I believe justified by looking at Nanahoshi, who was stroking Linnea's ears and singing anime theme songs <laughs> in Japanese. <laughs> just, ru just rubbing <laughs> Linnea's ears, just singing. If you didn't occasionally cut loose and forget your troubles, you wouldn't be able to go on. Life was full of pain after all. Without finding good, you would crumble. Barigari and Elise probably knew that from their many years, which that's kind of an interesting point. And I, and I think I sort of got that indication from Bodyguardi a long time ago. I think somebody sort of mentioned that in the series. But yes, you would assume that Bodyguardi has gone through so many years and seen so many people die and so much suffrage. And yes, the mortality of a lot of people that at some point he probably realized or Kishirika told him to. You got to be merry. You got to enjoy things. Enjoy the moments you have with people. And it's also that aspect of why he rushed to see Rudius and the idea that you humans don't last very long. So I gotta, I gotta come over here and say hi to you. So it explains why, at least with Bodyguardi for sure. And yes, technically Ellen Elise, which I think Ellen Elise is more her trying to drown away her past problems and sort of mask the issues that she's possibly creating. But I can definitely see it in Bodyguardi. Sylvia and Rudius was going to drink to their heart's content despite not drinking much at home. They weren't used to it. But then Rudius finally understood how bad a drunk Sylphie was. <laughs> it wasn't that she was bad, it was just that she was the clingy type. She became an adorable creature, asking him to pat her on the head and eat her ears. She's into that kind of stuff. But it made him want to tell her not to drink outside, more for his sake, because he can't control himself. She also got extremely jealous. <laughs> But not for other women, because the reason is like, oh, well, if you're jealous about those other girls, I'll just stay away from them. No, she was jealous of Rajerd. The way Rudius talked about him made Sylphie not like it. She wanted him to only pay attention to her. I knew it. I knew Sylphie was the Yandere character. I called it. I called it. She never wanted to express it because she doesn't, she's not that great at communicating. But I knew it way back in, in Buena Village. She was going to be the young, she was going to be the Yandere Yark archetype. We've already kind of mentioned this idea that, and this is a cool thing with Refugian. He likes to create archetypes, but he breaks them really quickly. Edis? Hmm, I wonder, maybe Sundere? <laughs> they have the archetypes in this series, but they spin them. And I, I kind of firmly believe that Sylphie was going to be the Yandere. And typically, in a lot of cases, Yandere are childhood friends. They're from the beginnings because they get this attachment and they don't want anybody else to have the main protagonist. And the solidification of that for me was the moment that Rudy was being shipped off to Edis. Sylphie tried to kill Paul. <laughs> if he didn't deflect that attack, Sylphie would have killed Paul. And this is kind of solidifying it for me. Rajerd of all people. Rudy has talked about Oh yeah, it's Rajerd. He's such a cool guy. He helped me with this and got me all the way over to here. And she's just like, pay attention to me. Don't talk about Rajerd. I want you to pay attention. See, that's what she's basically doing. She's like, Rudy, stop talking about Rajerd. Look at me, Rudy. <laughs> she's totally Yandere. And this is kind of what I was sort of thinking that was going to be with Sylphie is that she's the type that she doesn't know how to express it, but she's a me, me, me type of person. She needs attention. She wants Rudy to look at her. And it sort of has me a little bit fearful for the future, but I don't know. We'll see. She seems like she's very good at internalizing it. We're seeing that right here. Rudy's is realizing right here, this is her true self. Like this is the side coming out of her that's possibly her true side. Now it could be Rudius believing that. Typically, yes, getting uh, inebriated can sometimes make you say things you wouldn't normally say. But in a lot of cases, it also makes people talk stupid. I've, I've dealt with people that just talk stupid. But sometimes you think of, is that how you truly feel then? And you know, the more that I think of this, the more it gets scary. <laughs> and honestly, it gets really scary the more I think about this. 
is she just really clingy? Or, in usual refuge and fashion, is he attempting to get her into a storyline that is going to get into a more deeper subject, a more troubling subject? An aspect of a character's deeper inner desires. Was all those chapters focused on Sylphie just to say how much she loves Rudius? Or was it to show how obsessed she was? Yes, it technically gets in the whole aspect of how Rudius was technically trying to brainwash her or was going to attempt to brainwash her as I got into it that whole segment. Or again, putting that aside, is it just to show that Sylphie is just a little too crazy? This writer doesn't just do tropes for the sake of doing tropes. He always does something with them. Just like with Edis, she was a Sundere, but she's not just a Sundere. I think he's getting into the Yandere character, and I wonder how Rudis is going to handle it. Right now, he's being very passive. Oh, well, I won't go near girls. He's literally telling her, I'll stay away from all females for you. Which is a very toxic thing to agree to. That is a very troubling and bad relationship thing. This is, again, one of, another one of those things that I don't particularly care for Sylphie myself. That's not my ideal partner, is somebody that will say, I don't want you to be around this person. Full well knowing what Rudius went through with Rajerd. Again, this is the drinking talking, and it could just be something she's spewing that's not actually her truth. But what, again, Rudius is believing, what Rudius himself is believing, is that she's stating what she really feels. And he's agreeing to it. That's a bad partner, Rudius. You don't agree to somebody that you'll stay away from other people. Especially somebody who is literally like a father figure to you. That's not a healthy relationship. And yes, even going so far as that you cannot be around other females, that's a bad partner. That is something you need to address with her. No, I can't do that. Let her sober up. Say, hey, you said something last night. I don't know if it's actually true, but I do want to be around other people. Those are my friends over there. Richard is like a father to me. You're going to have to accept that I'm going to be around other people. But that aside, again, I think the more interesting question, this is the thing that I'm excited for, if this is the direction the writer's going. I know the chat's probably going nuts right now. I don't need confirmation, denial. <laughs> Will it get to a point where Sylphie goes too far and Rudius has to tell her, stop. Will it be his sisters that are coming up? Is he suddenly going to go, you know, I'm, I'm going to go hang out with Aisha. We're going to go out shopping together. And she's going to go, you've been hanging around Aisha too much. Pay attention to me. And you're going to have to finally say, whoa. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> I don't know. Or will it get even further than that in the idea of, again, because this writer likes to get really deep and pretty heavy in these subjects, what if she goes too far another way? Again, she technically nearly killed his father. Yes, she was young, but she, as many people point out and argue, she hasn't really technically matured around other people and learned social norms. Would she harm somebody? Would she, for example, harm Aisha, being jealous of her? And we can get into that more heavier subject of, again, what is a yandere? Crazy love. Too much. Too clingy. Pay attention to me and nobody else. That's a Yandere character. She's literally playing it out. But we'll see. Reese went on to explain that she seemed like she was fine when he talked about Rajerd. But this must be how she really felt. He always thought it seemed scary that she accepted everything. With such perfect equanimity. But maybe she worked hard to make it seem that way. Yeah? <laughs> it's technically Silent Fits. That's what Silent Fits is accept everything and don't speak. She's been kind of molded to be this thing that just stands there and says nothing. And as things happen around her, unless it's a threat to Ariel, she doesn't speak out. And I think that internalizing pretty much brought us to the point that we are now where she literally doesn't speak out when she needs something. At the same time, now that she has a thing that she finally has always desired and internally was always wanting, she's very clingy to it. She doesn't want anything else around it, and she doesn't want him looking at other people. We kind of got that feeling with the Sylphie chapters. And that was sort of another thing that was compounding on my Yandere theory, is the idea that she was constantly going, Rudy's looking at somebody else. Rudy's looking at somebody else. Is that his wife? Is that his wife? That was all she was thinking about. Where's, where's Rudius? Where's Rudius? As he pulled Sylphie to his lap, Nanahoshi came over and protested his public display. <laughs> Noting how long it's been since she was without her boyfriend. He was honestly ready to sing a duet with her for a popular Japanese song. At least go somewhere where people can't see you if you're going to make out. Come on, don't be like that. 
They've got alcohol here. Let's just have fun together. Besides, I've been wanting to say this to you for a while now. Even from inside my room, smooch, smooch, creak, creak. What the hell is marriage anyways, huh? What is it? I mean, I'm. it's fine, whatever, but what the hell? There, there I was, totally down the dumps, and you two were having s- yeah. I could even hear your voices echoing at night. Body God, he suddenly lifted Nanahoshi into his arms. <laughs> Waha, come along. Today you will sing me your bizarre songs. <laughs> They're not bizarre, they're popular in my world. How very interesting. I know not what world you come from, but sing them for me. Go on then, sing as much as you can. Hold on, I have something to say to Rudius first. Bwahaha, you are better off singing if you have nothing nice to say to the man who helped you out. Now, sing. <laughs> I always love how simple and just direct Padigati is. I was just leading into what I really wanted to say. She probably wanted to thank Rudius, but she didn't need to. He did what a friend would do when they were in trouble. As Nanahoshi sang and Badigati played an instrument at her side, they were bad. They, she was horrible. Still, they were enjoying themselves. And Nanahoshi was a star of the group today. Did she really want to go home that badly? It was something that Rudius couldn't understand. The country he loved was right here. I don't know, it, it, it almost feels like with this whole scene and how much Nanahoshi's kind of opened up with, it sort of makes you think, is there a possibility she's gonna get comfortable? I don't know. I don't think so. I think she's still going to want to go because this is technically what she's been trying to avoid. There is a side of me that almost believes it's not so much that she doesn't believe anything is real here. Like she said something to the effect that people here don't seem real to me. I think it's more that she's afraid of getting connected with anybody because she knows she's leaving. It's like the person that's just kind of temporarily moving someplace. They don't want to meet anybody because they know they're going to move two minutes later. It's like a military family. You just don't meet people in your school because you're just afraid you're going to move two seconds later. Once Nanahoshi pretty much crashed, <laughs> the party ended and everybody started heading home. As Rudius returned home with Sylphie, he noticed a banging on the door and arguing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so happy. Sylphie cast a detoxification on them and Rudy activated his demon eye just in case. The only reason that we're this late is because you got us lost, Norn. Same goes for you, Aisha. You're the one that said it was definitely this way. Besides, we don't even know if it's really this place or not. What are you even gonna do now? All the ends are closed. Now we're gonna have to make camp outside in the cold. I don't like this either, but you're the one who said we'd stay at his place. I didn't even want to stay at his house, but you forced me to come along. That's because we told Ginger we'd be all right. Getting a room after all this would be stupid. You're always like that. You're always acting like you're better. The voices were familiar. And yes, the names mentioned confirmed it. Both of you calm down. This is definitely the place. There's a familiar presence here. A composed man's voice. The instant he heard it, Rudius knew. A whirlpool of indescribable motion rose up in Rudius. He sighed a relief and stepped in front of them. Ah. Oh. Big brother, I missed you. Aisha flew at Rudius, wrapping her arms and legs around his torso like a monkey, <laughs> rubbing her cheek against Rudius's. <laughs> <Just, laughs> she want to let go after this. Oh, you feel so warm and you stink of alcohol and you're making me cold. Please let go. Rudius peeled Aisha off and noted Norn was pursing her lip, dropping her chin in a greeting. You you drink alcohol? Yeah, we had a bit of a celebration. She looked perturbed, but not because she was shy, but probably because Paul said she wasn't his biggest fan. Now, as we find out later, it's because he's drinking. It's like bad first impression. <laughs> we like established in the extra chapter that, yeah, she really doesn't like people that drink. Except for Paul. Paul's okay. Daddy can do it, but nobody else. Uh, so yeah, like her first impression is literally that Rudius is drunk. Well, he's not drunk, he just had drank. He, I mean, the detoxification has removed most of that inebriation. It's been a while, Rudius. Proud warrior, wielding a lance, looking no different than three years ago. It's been a while, Mr. Richard. <laughs> oh, it's like a wave of emotion. It's finally the reunion after, shoot, four, four volumes. Finally, Richard returns after so long. I miss... Richard. It's so funny because somebody was asking the other day, do you think that, you know, yeah, Soldat went down on the list or something like that? And I think I mentioned that Zenoba is like my best bro right now. But now I, does body, it's like, it's like Richard body, uh, oh man, body Gotti versus Zenoba. I think it's probably Richard Zenoba body Gotti, maybe. I, I think that's the horror. <laughs> Ask me in two minutes, I'll change my mind. Richard is always going to be, it, he's technically Richard's best bro. Papa, like Gizzard's Papa, like <laughs> this is plainly what he is. He's like the best dad in the series, even though he had a terrible fatherhood. <laughs> so bad. 
Rudius was hit with a wave of nostalgia. The days the three of them traveled, how they met, how they parted. Rudius was fighting for something to say. I heard at the Adventure Guild that you had gotten married, but I see it wasn't to Edis. Oof. And now it starts. <laughs> now it starts. Rizard was looking at Sylphie before bowing. Sylphie then invited them all inside. And that is chapter 11. Honestly, really interesting way to conclude Nanahoshi's story. I really wasn't sure they were going to go that direction. I honestly figured it was going to be one of those aspects of she sort of found something. But finding a remedy for it, I think, is the more interesting aspect of it. Not so much him pushing her to try again but rather finding a method that she can use that will, that's something that she hadn't discovered before. And to be honest, it's something that I think nobody would have been able to figure it out if it weren't for the fact that Rudius, Zenoba, and Cliff discovered that doll. Because I'd imagine, again, she's been traveling all over the world and she's been looking for anything. And yet this is something new to her. This is something that she uh, assumingly has never seen before and makes sense because this is sort of a forbidden thing that this doll is. This this doll is a forbidden art. Now, that's not to say there's no multi-layered magical circles in the world and that the multi-layered circles are forbidden. It could be. Multi-layers could be forbidden. But it, I'm more thinking it's an idea that it's a, it's a lost art. Like many other things in this world, it's just lost because nobody passed it down. So it's interesting that I'm curious of what that's going to turn into. Did Cliff seeing this go, hmm, I wonder if I can create something, magical implement with multi-layers that might be a lot more complicated that will help me with my issue. Again, I love this writer and how they compound things upon themselves and always adding to the, the formula to create an ultimate ev evolution in the magic itself. Again, what Rudius told Cliff and Ellen Elise about the cursed child and blessed child about the idea of transferring curses, the idea of magical implements, Cliff looking into magical implements, and the ideas there he had with the idea of getting rid of a magical implement's mana versus getting rid of what's mana disturbances inside of a person, which is a cursed child. Adding that with the forbidden stuff that with the doll and how that kind of adds multi-layers to summoning, all that kind of stuff, it's super cool. I, I love how well thought out the magic and systems are in this world. They're not so complicated that they, they kind of lose you as it explains it, it all makes sense. It's simple enough that it makes sense, but at the same time, adds complexity to everything they're doing. Super good. I'm like, wonder how much of this he's just completely pre-planned out. Like he's got this big old textbook of notes that he wrote down while in college. And then he's like, okay, let's write it. But yeah, moving on to chapter 12, nostalgia and frustration. This chapter, I am so mixed on. <laughs> I'm so mixed on this chapter, it's not even funny. I don't, I just, I don't want to believe this is the full context here. I really do feel like this is not the full context of this chapter, but it seems like it is. As they sat there, Rudius thanked Rajurd for getting his sisters there safely. No need of thanks. Protecting children is only natural. Rudius was still surprised the person Paul mentioned was Rajurd. He honestly thought there was a possibility that it was Ghislaine. <laughs> I guess, could have been. I can see that being a possibility in Rudius's mind. He knew that he went with Edis somewhere, but... Where to is the question mark. But if he was escorting children, Rajurd was the best man for the job. I, I think Elaine does okay job, but yes, technically very young kids, probably more difficult for Elaine to handle. She probably wouldn't be able to feed them is the problem. <laughs> the problem is feeding the children. Rius felt that he was so reliable that, yeah, he would hire him just to be Aisha and Norn's bodyguard for life if possible. Still, Rius was at a loss at what to talk about. It had been so long since they talked. Now granted, even back then, <laughs> Reserve was quiet, and not much for small talk. Here I want to mention, what immediately came to my mind when I read that part, yeah, technically Reserve was not for small talk. They they talked here and there, they would have these pretty expansive conversations, usually whenever there's like a key pinnacle point in their story. Like say for instance, when he mentioned the idea of the curse in Reserve and how it might be going away and everything he talked to the man god after Orsted nearly killed him. Those are those brief moments where Reserve really kind of opened up and they had a long conversation. But I think what kind of popped in my head more at this moment is yet, yeah, they never had many long conversations back in the day. But Rudius, I think more so has changed. He's opened himself up more. He converses with people a lot more. He's gotten a less formal and that's really around his new friends that he's met 
at this school. He's opened up more. He was never that talkative before, or at least that comfortable talking. By the way, what happened to Edis? Rhys honestly didn't want to talk about it, but he knew Richard deserved to know. He told him everything after they parted ways. Sleeping together, disappearing, despair, searching for his mother, meeting Elise, following Mangod's recommendation, reuniting with Sylphie, and their wedding. I see, that happens often. It happens often? It's an outlook warriors often get bogged down by. I'm sure Edis doesn't hate you. But she said the two of us weren't well balanced. I have no idea whether she meant those words literally, or if you just misunderstood her meaning. Misunderstood? Yes. Edis was never very good with words. Yep. <laughs> yep. Richard would know he wasn't either. At the very least, she liked you when we were traveling together. If you have the opportunity to meet again, keep a cool head and talk to her about it. Rius wondered if he got it all wrong. Oof. <laughs> Finally, Rudius realizes. And it just took Richard to point it out. You jumped to a conclusion and it spiraled your head into a crazy spiral of misunderstanding. And it only took Papa Rizur to come in and say, yeah, she sucks at talking. <laughs> you should have figured that out a long time ago, Rudius. <laughs> Why that didn't dawn on you? I don't know. You knew her longer than I did, but you didn't see it. <laughs> and again, I think there's a part of here that again, Rizur of anybody understands. Because he's a warrior, just like Edis. And he also knows that she sucks at talking. And so in the face of Rudius making this misinterpretation of what she said, a misunderstanding of what she said, he's like, what do you mean? I don't think that means what you think it means, Rudius. You misunderstood what she was talking about. Again, Rudius wondered if he got it all wrong. Maybe by well balance, she meant she wasn't at his level. Yep. Had she left to get stronger and then return? Yep. If that was the case, maybe she meant for him to wait for her. Yep. But it was too late to be told that now. No matter what she meant, he spent three years suffering. And that's the sucky part. <laughs> and that's the sucky part. It's technically Rudius blaming Edis, but at the same time, it's his fault too. Because he misunderstood her, came to his own conclusions, he suffered. And because she was terrible with words and gave him something that he would misinterpret, she was wrong. They're both technically wrong. But Rudius was so weak. He's he even back then, he's still technically a little bit now, back then extremely weak-minded person. And thus completely misconstrued everything because he always assumed everybody hated him. Everybody didn't like him. Everybody was out to get him. That that bullied mindset was still in him. Fresh. But yes, no matter what she meant, three years of suffering. Three years with no peep from her. It's not like she gets to just phones you up, dude. <laughs> she, she didn't even pick up a phone and call you. You haven't even heard of, it took you forever to get a peep from Paul. <laughs> That's communication in this world. The person who finally saved him was Sylphie, not Edis. What was he supposed to do now? Toss Sylphie to the side and make up with Edis? There was no way. I don't think that's what they're implying. <laughs> Again, this is, goes back to my my ongoing, I think my my biggest criticism of Rudius, I think even at this point, after so long of so much maturing with him, he still only thinks of everything as sex and have to get in a relationship. Never sees things as just strictly friendships and bonds with other people. It's always got to be about, oh, what am I supposed to do? Go back and have sex with Edis? N no, dude, just chill. Just Become friends, bond with each other. Something besides just you have to bang something and bag something. That's why he rushed into marrying with Sylphie. I gotta bag her, I gotta get her married quickly because that's what I do now. He never really thinks things through in a sense of take your time. And again, that's because the anxieties of what he misinterpreted with Edis. Again, I know that, but it's still, he's always rushing. Plus, Rius was a little terrified by the thought of meeting Edis. It wasn't that he didn't trust what Richard said, but there was a chance that she had gotten fed up with him. Again, you're still misinterpreting what she said, and Richard's trying to tell you that. But again, I think he's almost thinking that Richard might be wrong. It would be a blow to his feeling if he approached her with the intent of reconciling, only to have her punch him in the face and refuse to look in his eyes. He decided to stop thinking about it. Whatever the truth, there was no change in the past. Dwelling on it wouldn't help. So just run away from it. <laughs> That's Rudius 101. 
Don't think about it. Run away from it. Just like with Seta. <laughs> what did he do with Sarah? Don't think about it. Just walk away from it. Just run away. Just don't think about it. Just run away. He hasn't changed. What have you been doing this whole time, Mr. Richard? Oh, yeah. Richard honestly looked like he was about to say something else, but he kind of nodded and went along with the conversation. After I parted ways with you, I headed to the forest area in the southern region. Apparently, Richard was looking for a Sepertride. He headed to a dense forest to the south of the King Dragon Mountains and searched it for two years. But alas, nothing. That's a long time to spend in some random forest. <laughs> this dude just survives everything. He did find some belongings that they believe that were from people that died from the displacement incident, which he returned to a nearby town. He then headed south along the coast to arrive at Eastport. He planned on gathering information coming out of Millis. Then he was planning on heading to search the conflict zone, but he ran to Paul. At that time, Paul was hesitant about sending his two daughters, but Richard volunteered. Oh. I met your master too. Master Roxy? Yeah. She was a little different than what you described. Really? In what way? The second I said my name and she saw the gem on my forehead, she was completely terrified. <laughs> yes, Roxy did say that she seen Superds as terrifying killers. Rudius wished that he would have been able to see the look on her face. <laughs> we started seeing it with, um, what was it, like the first core? She was panicking. She did not like Richard, or at least the idea of a superb being in the area. Yes, Ginger came along as well. While Richard, Aisha, and Norm were searching for Ruiz's house, Ginger split off to cover more ground. After getting lost, Richard stumbled upon Ruiz's footprints that led them there. While talking, Ruiz couldn't help but smile. One of the greatest sources of pride for Ruiz was the fact that he was recognized as a friend by Richard. I think there was so much in that last moment when they parted ways. I think I remember that I got super emotional in that section because there was so much in it that implied so much more than the anime did. The idea that Richard at that moment realized that he has been wasting hundreds of years of his life trying to fix the Serpert problem, but Rudius, in a matter of three years, changed his complete outlook on how it was going to work and finally gave him hope. Damn sure he's a friend of yours. You changed his life so much. And he didn't want Rudius to bow to him. He didn't want to pat his head. They were equals. He's seen him as a man. But yeah, apparently they made it here in only a couple months because Aisha, her eagerness, and yes, technically her craftiness. She really badly wanted to see her brother, but she's really crafty. Aisha had proposed they accompany a merchant caravan so that they could travel at night. She suggested offering Richard and Ginger services as guards. She even figured out a quicker route by retracing their steps, going to previous towns, and finding a more suitable caravan. Richard had mentioned that it was been a while since he felt like he was being ordered around. <laughs> Perhaps recalling his times during the Laplace War. While Richard didn't mind this, which, yes, he was always soft when it came to children, Rudius knew that he needed to give Aisha proper talking because he didn't want her to grow up to be the type that thinks that she could just order people around. She's going to do it anyways. Aisha's a spitfire. She's going to do it anyways. <laughs> but she just slept her like a log while you two worked nonstop, didn't she? She wasn't sleeping. She was constantly calculating our route, planning for us to travel in the most efficient way possible. She's still a child, though. Although their travel was fast, it wasn't without a hitch. Both Aisha and Norn collapsed with exhaustion part way. It seems part of Aisha's plan was for them to make it there before winter hit, before it would get difficult to travel. Ginger honestly didn't mind the whole fast-paced movement because she was just eager to see Zenoba again. <laughs> yes, when she got back there, she planned on actually resuming her service to the prince, which is totally cool. I want to see Julie. I want to see what Ginger thinks of Julie. All that said, Rudius had hopes to introduce Rizur to his friends. Zenoba would be delighted. Lenny and Persena would probably have something to say. Who knew what Cliff would think? And there was a chance that Richard and Bodigati were already acquaintance. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But that all came crashing down when Richard mentioned that he was planning on leaving the next day. Dude can't sit still. This is Richard. Again, the moment that they arrived at the refugee camp, after three years of traveling together, the moment they got to the refugee camp, gone. He doesn't stick around. Which is really interesting to see the difference between how Richard sees time versus Bodigati. Bodigati just kind of takes his time around places and he never realizes how long he stays somewhere. Whereas Reserve's like constantly never waste time, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Yes, Reserve had apparently heard that someone seen a devil deep in the woods to the east. He wanted to check it out. I'm curious about this one. 
I'm really curious about this one. I don't need to know chat, but I'm wondering if something's been mentioned yet that would technically be that. Yes, technically Bodyguardi came from the east, but he kind of just bulldozed through. There wasn't no like somebody seen it and went, oh my gosh, there's a devil out in the forest. So I don't think it's gonna be that. I want to say it's, I want to say that it's Kishirika, but she apparently can't leave the demon continent. Unless she figured out a way to leave the demon continent, shouldn't be Kishirika. The only one that I'm sort of thinking, but I'm not sure exactly where it's laid out. It might be Edis. As we find out, Edis leaves the Sword Sanctum and goes out and trains. But I thought that she was going out north. And I know, and I think that the Sword Sanctum is supposed to be up in the far north. I'd have to double check. Let me check that now. Yeah, she went north, and it just says that the Source Sanctum is in the north. My assumption, and this sucks because I don't have a detailed map, and it doesn't really fully quantify where everything's at, and that's the sucky thing. Every now and then I'll say east or west or something, but unfortunately it seems like, from what I'm seeing, it doesn't indicate anything about where exactly east or north, west or whatever in the northern region the Source Sanctum is. But my assumption has always been that, that the Magic Nations and stuff are kind of in that western area, whereas, I forget what the name of the other place is, or more towards the east. That's the area that Bodyguardi charged through in order to get to where Rudis is at. So my assumption is that maybe the Source Sanctum is more over to the east-northeast area. I know this is backwards way I'm pointing here. <laughs> more east-northeast area. I think that's probably where the Source Sanctum is. It could be more or towards the, the west. But either way... She left out the north, northern area of the Sword Sanctum, and I assume that the Sword Sanctum is more north-north in the northern region. Either way, my assumption right now, my my indication is probably Edis. Because the way they kind of describe Edis and she's currently training is just mindlessly swinging her sword, and she doesn't want to have anything to do with anybody. So if anybody looks like a devil out in the middle of nowhere, it's probably Edis. So I think Reserved is going to reunite with Edis, which is super fantastic. Um, and then he's gonna have to, he's gonna be the one to break the news to her. Oof. At least she'll know by the time she gets to him and maybe she can stop worrying about him at this point and move on with her life. I don't know. We'll see. Besides, I have no intention in getting in your way. Of course not. You'd never be in my way. It's also a bit difficult to be here. Oof. <laughs> This is where I'm starting to wonder if it's really implying this or if Rudius is drawing the wrong conclusions. It's always difficult to hear what Rudius draws conclusions from. Again, this most of these chapters are Rudius's perspective and what he believes people are thinking. And so he's making a lot of assumptions here of what Rajur believes. But it's kind of hard to believe. I, I, I'll get more into it later. <laughs> Let me get through this whole section and I'll get I'll get into it as a full encompassing story here. Rudius assumed it was because he and Edis weren't together. Perhaps in Rajur's position, he'd be uncomfortable seeing him cozying up to Sylphie. Rudius felt like there was some sort of rift that formed in their friendship. Maybe Edis was the foundation that kept them together. I don't think that far. I don't think we're going that far, Rudius. Rudius, don't make that face. I'll come back again. Rudius forced a smile. He didn't regret marrying Sylphie. However, he did feel he made some sort of mistake. If I happen to meet Edis, I'll see what she has to say. Please do. At this point, Sylphie emerged after giving Norn and Aisha a bath before they passed out. Sylphie made a passing comment about Aisha recognizing her right away, obviously implying that Rudius took forever. <laughs> but Rudius fired back saying, well, you're not currently wearing glasses and wearing boys clothes. But again, I would recognize the fact that yes, Aisha is extremely clever. She would probably figure things out a lot quicker than Rudius. However, Norn didn't recognize Sylphie. Again, because she's normal. <laughs> Norn's normal. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Sylphiette Grey Rat. Yeah, I'm Rajard Superdia. <laughs> he just doesn't care. <laughs> Rajard just doesn't care. Well, he's always short for words. I'm just joking. He's short on words. He's always been short on words. They awkwardly shook hands. Reese thought about how they both suffered from green hair but discarded it. Obviously with Rajard, he shaved his head bald and again, Sylphie lost it from the displacement incident. While yes, Sylphie offered him a room, Rudius knew he wouldn't use a bed. Instead, Rudius just offered him to sleep wherever he liked, just like Rajard typically does. He's used to how Rajard just kind of finds a corner and lays. Rudius is just used to the fact that he'll find a corner and sit down. And with that, 
he retired for the night, choosing to sleep in the room Aisha and Norn were in. Which yes, he joked about the fact of him being a lolly con, but no, Rudius knew that that's just how he was. He never took his eyes off of Rudius and Edis when they were traveling together. And he probably is doing the same with them. While yes, Sylphie was concerned that she offended him, Rudius mentioned the fact that he was just slow to warming up to people. Though inside, Rudius felt he had a conflicting feelings about his marriage with Sylphie. The next morning, now here's the interesting thing. The next morning when Rudius woke up, again, he was sleeping next to Sylphie, but he struggled with even touching her as she laid there. Typically, he wakes up and he immediately grabs her chest, but this time, something felt off. He felt like he was under the weather. Yes, he should be happy that Rajard was here, but it seemed Edis was weighing on his mind. He felt gloomy and restless. Again, he's starting to realize, I messed up back here. Not that he regrets marrying Sylphie, that he just messed up with this. Despite his motivation being gone, he went on his daily training. Stepping out the front door, he found two men waiting outside. Rajard and Bodygotti. <laughs> Ugh, I should have seen this coming. I should have seen this coming from my- This is one of those things where it's like, it's so obvious this is gonna be a thing. And you just don't even think about it until it actually happens. And it's like, yeah, I should have seen that one. Bodygotti was wearing a serious face for once. He wasn't blah and like he usually is. Yes, one was a captain of Laplace's Imperial Guard. The other was a moderate faction on the opposite side. These people were at odds at some point. While yes, currently Rajard despised Laplace, their circumstances were different back then. Upon Bodygotti glancing at Rudius and back to Rajard, he gave a, so that's it, before turning and walking away. Rajard looked a bit anxious as he glanced to Rudius. It was rare to see him in a cold sweat. <laughs> this is like the last time we seen that was with Orsted. Did something happen between you and King Batty? A long time ago. With stories of the Superge tribe madness, Rudius assumed some in their path were Bodygotti's people. While he wasn't committed to ruling, Bodygotti would probably seek revenge for his citizens. And sadly, he possibly didn't know that it was Laplace that did that to the Superge tribe. Rudius figured he'd talk to Bodygotti about it the next time they met. He also wondered how he would react to his plans to mass produce Rajard figures. <laughs> Rudius always got to throw a dumb comment at the very end of a very serious note. But now this is very interesting, the idea that yes, technically they were at odds. And and then there's an argument to be made that despite the fact that yes, the Spears made the Superds tribe mad, it doesn't excuse the fact that they were still technically on Laplace's side to begin with. They may have just not harmed those that were not a part of the war, and maybe Bodygotti would not be angry at the idea of Rajard in front of him. I think Bodygotti knows that Rajard escorted Rudius. I think they came to that conclusion a long time ago. And now it's just sort of because even Roxy mentioned the idea that, oh yeah, I heard these rumors that that yeah, there was this dead this dead inn that was traveling with Rudius. And she just never believed it. But body God he probably connected it here. Yeah. So it's true. This guy escorted Rudius. This is a guy that protected Rudius. And despite the fact that he may have wanted to, yes, get revenge on on Reserd, at this point he's going, at least now now's not the time. <laughs> but man, I, I am just Waiting for this in anime format, just him open the door and then, okay, there's these two just standing there staring at each other. And you're like, wait, Body Dottie's mad. <laughs> we don't see Body Dottie mad. Body Dottie is mad. Mr. Reserd, just to be clear, that man has been good to me ever since I came to the city. I can only imagine what must have happened in the past, but don't worry. I have no intentions of fighting him. Still, I never thought I'd see him here of all places. Apparently, he came here to see me. Ah, well, that does fit his character. Reserd forced a smile as he entered the house. When Rudius returned back to the house, Rudius went to call Norn to breakfast, nearly walking in on her to a surprise naked scene. <laughs> but thankfully he felt, he felt the aura, this looming threat, do not open this door. Instead, just call out to her and say, come to breakfast. I'm not gonna be the dull-witted protagonist that I used to be. Following breakfast, Richard prepared to depart. Again, doesn't stick around long. As they went with Richard to the exit of the city, Norn grabbed Richard's shirt. While it was very subtle not to notice, Rajard noticed and slowed his pace. He's such a, he's such a dad. He's such a dad. She didn't seem to want to part with Rajard, and Rudius understood that feeling. He just seeing his past self following Rajard in Norn, which is, I wonder, which I'm really at this point thinking that's going to be the connecting thread. I really do think Rajard is going to be the thing that helps 
Rudius and Norn come together, but we'll see. We'll see. They have a common love for Rajerd. Rudius honestly thought of asking him to stay longer. Then he'd be able to introduce him to all of his friends, but the thought of Edis held Rudius back, as expected. He didn't want to cause Rajerd discomfort, and he felt right here again that the fact that he wasn't with Edis was causing Rajerd pain. Yes, it wasn't Sylphie's fault in Rudius's mind, of course. But Rudius didn't feel like he could really talk to Rajerd until he cleared things up with Edis. But he didn't even know where she was. Rajerd's going to her, probably. <laughs> well then, stay safe. You as well. The goodbyes were short. And there was so much that Rudius wanted to say. This is literally <laughs> copy and paste their past parting. Like Rudius, again, back way back here with the with the refugee camp, he had so much he wanted to say to Rajerd and he couldn't find the words. And similar, he'll say the same thing in parting. It's so cool. Though it wasn't as if goodbyes were forever. He just have to talk to him once things calm down. It's like, I think again, same thing, same thought process. Next time, next time, which always scares me when that happens. It's totally a flag, <laughs> it's totally a flag. Thank you for taking care of us. Aisha, don't demand too much of Rudius. Yes, I know. He patted on the head with a stiff smile. M Mr. Rajerd? Norn had an anxious look, still holding on to Rajerd. Don't worry, we'll meet again. Seeing the two of them dredged up memories of back when he parted ways with Rajerd, Norn's face contorted into several different expressions, as if she wanted to say something. Finally, she made up her mind. I, I want to go with you. Rajerd looked troubled and then stroked her head. After several seconds, Norn's eyes filled with tears. It's like that moment of like, you know it's not gonna happen. <laughs> She's just like, damn it. Again, I don't get what I want. It hurts though, it hurts. Everybody falls in love with Rajerd. He's just a big teddy bear. Rely on Rudius from now on, not me. But I can't, he and father. That's in the past. He has already reflected on his actions. Your father did as well. I told you about the hardship he had been through as we traveled. Even you accepted that. But yesterday he was drunk. And he's with a different girl this time than he was last time. I can't trust him. Yes, Sylphie was told this story already. It wasn't like Reese was being a playboy. <laughs> it's like he has to defend himself from his own mind. But yes, that probably wasn't how it looked like to Norn. Rizor then looked to Sylphie and to Rudius and forced a smile. That's just the way of things between men and women. It happens. It absolutely doesn't mean your brother is disloyal. All the Edda's fans are like, no, <laughs> it does mean that, Richard. Over there, you, will you tell me your name once more? Oh, uh, uh, yes, I'm Sylphiet. Sylphiet, I leave these two and Rudius to your care. Uh, of course. Richard finally exchanged words with Sylphie at the very end. His feelings towards her was surely complicated, but Rudius prayed he held no ill will. Well then, let's meet again. Rius watched him go until he couldn't see him anymore. The last time he watched him, he was filled with gratitude, and he was sure that Aisha and Norn felt that same feeling. <laughs> Literally reserves here for one chapter, and then he's gone again. There's a side of me that really does get frustrated with how he doesn't sit still. It's like, just hang out for a little bit, Richard. <laughs> Rajerd does add a chemistry and it's typically like just very stern justice. But still it's like, does it, it just, he doesn't add enough that we just have to keep kicking him and telling him to go somewhere else. It does make me hope that eventually he does get some sort of payment for all of his searching. He finds somebody, but um, yeah, it sucks. But again, what I've been putting off talking about is obviously the big elephant in the room. Does Rajerd really is his discomfort that he's talking about the fact that Rudius is with Sylphie. Again, there's a side of me that almost believes, no, I don't think that's it. I don't want to believe that Rajerd is that troubled. But then as I sat and I thought about this chapter longer and longer, it started to sink into my head that, yeah, I think he is not comfortable with this. If you think about it, they went through so much together in those three years, and it was such a big impact on Rajerd because Rudius changed him, changed the perspective on everything, and yes, he grew a strong bond to Edis, who he trained night after night after night. And he knew, I think he knew why Edis was doing it. I think he knew why Edis was fighting so hard. And so, him seeing that Rudy, within a few years, 
is already with somebody else, I think that bothers him. It's almost like you see who you assumed was going to marry what is essentially your daughter <laughs> is with some other woman. Like, why? Why, Rudius? You guys were so close. She loved you so much. Now, Rajur doesn't know how much Sylphie loved him and that Sylphie is technically the same situation, but still, he walked together with him. They were a band of three. They were dead end. Even when Rudius talked about the fact that he took his name or he disbanded dead end, he wondered what everybody would have thought of that because it was such a bond that the three of them had. And now Rajur's basically seeing that Rudius had discarded that by one note that Rajur himself knows Rudius misread. And because of Rudius misreading that, he made the wrong decision and left Edis. Didn't wait for her. And in a sense, I, I think this might actually come into play if we might learn more about the Superb tribe. That might be something with the Superb tribes themselves that seems kind of disloyal to him. Now, yes, he does tell them, you know, that doesn't mean your brother is disloyal. But there might be an aspect there where he sees marriage and sees relationships differently than what Rudius sees it or human sees it. And that this might be something that doesn't make any sense to him. That it seems like he made a bad mistake. And it's very, very interesting to have Rudius, based on this whole encounter, really get conflicted by it. Suddenly realize, did I make a mistake? Did I jump the gun? Did I make a wrong decision? No, I love Sylphie. I didn't make a wrong decision. But then I can't touch her. I'm feeling under the weather. This is weighing on me now. Did I mess up? He's thinking about Edis. And it's suddenly, now that his mind realizes that she didn't hate him, which I think is great. I think this is so good for Rudius. That he can stop thinking about, now it's got to be compounded on something else, let's be honest. He can stop thinking about, I wasn't right for her. She left me. She left me. Why did she leave me? I got to grab this. I got to grab this. I got to grab Sylphie. Sylphie. I can't let Sylphie get away. She's going to leave like Edis did. Everybody's going to leave me like Edis did. He has that, that distrust and that fear of people leaving him. He can now discard that. He can no longer think about how Edis left him and stop making decisions based on that fear. Stop jumping to marriage based on that fear of Sylphie leaving him too. He can now focus on, instead, <laughs> did I screw up? <laughs> and I, like I said, he's getting rid of one misconception, one thing that's been weighing on him and literally depressed him for three whole years and replacing it with, I messed up. I, I jumped to conclusions. Can I make amends with Edis now? Maybe we're not going to be enemies. Maybe when the next time I see her, she's not going to punch me in the face. Maybe she was telling me to wait. And now I, and I'm waiting for this to actually possibly come up. I walked away from her. She didn't walk away from me. I walked away from her. Now, granted, it's going to be very difficult for him to get past that thing that he's still sticking to. It doesn't, none of this matters because I suffered for three years. I've made a commitment to Sylphie. It's not like I can walk away from Sylphie, but maybe I'm the one that's going to break her heart. Not that she broke my heart. It's going to create a very interesting question in the future. And I, I'm kind of curious how that plays out. At the same time, it's still going to be heartbreaking. And again, I think that Rajurd is going to go see Edis because I think she is this devil in the forest because she's out there crazily swinging a sword. It, it breaks my heart. It really does. Cause I think, I think Rajurd is literally what I think a lot of people reading through this have been sort of screaming. Cause we all knew what Re Edis meant. We all knew that Edis made a stupid comment and Rajurd was the first person like literally speaking our words. Rudius, you misread that. She's a warrior and she sucks with words. She loved you. Maybe she just needed to get stronger. Maybe that was it. And it's so interesting to finally have that. And again, I was really assuming the realization point for Rudius was going to be Edis showing up and saying, that's not what I meant. What do you mean? I didn't abandon you. I went to go train. I had to get stronger. I was weak compared to you. I was holding you back. No. It's just Rajurd, <laughs> just literally telling him that. So it's it's a, it's at least going to change what that reunion might be, again, if Rajurd finds Edis first. There's one other random thought that has popped in my head that I do want to address as a possible thing that could happen. 
I love doing, people love my crazy, stupid predictions that either make them go, let him cook, he's way off, or my gosh, is he calling that? Again, as per usual in the chat, I don't need confirmation, denial, anything. Not a peep. The zip faces. Is it simply that Rajurd is uncomfortable being there? Because again, he's seen Edis and Rudy as a couple. He's seen them as pretty much married. They they should be together. Why are they not together? And seeing him with Sylphie bothers him because he knows how heartbroken Edis will be. Or does he possibly see something else in Sylphie? Is it not so much that he's bothered by Rudius making this decision, but is he uncomfortable with Sylphie? Again, I think it's the, the, the first. I, I really do think that's it. But my crazy theory, because I want to do this, is... What if it's possible that he sees something in Sylphie that's dangerous? Again, I'm still, I'm, st despite the fact that we've kind of answered this question about Ellen Elise and Sylphie, that lineage, I still don't really necessarily believe I have a full answer on why Sylphie's hair was green and why it changed. And that there's going to still be something special about Sylphie. Is it simply that she had green hair because she got part of the curse from Ellen Elise, like I joked about, because she's super thirsty. She's always super thirsty for Rudius, which I kind of got into earlier with the idea that it's the Yandere aspect. She's obsessed with him to a toxic level. Don't be around anybody else. Or is it an aspect that there's something within her? Is there still a curse in there? Does he see something else in her? Does he see something in her bloodline? That's something that's outside of Ellen Elise. Is there something on his, her mother's side that we don't know about yet? Or, again... In the end, is Sylphie even Annalise's granddaughter? They fled the Great Forest, went there. He had troubles getting with his wife and Sylphie's mother. But how long did she stay there to know that it was actually her granddaughter? By blood. Is there still a possibility that something else is different or special? Or maybe the fact that, yes, she's still her granddaughter. Yes, the daughter of Laws. Yes, the daughter of Laws' wife. I don't think they ever mentioned her name. But what if something was placed upon her? Cursed upon her? What if that's why her hair changed when she was transported? I, st I, th I still, f deep in my gut, still think there's something special about Sylphie, despite everything that's been answered, just because the hair, how it changed. And again, there's a possibility that Rajurd sees something there. Now, in the end, in parting, he does ask Sylphie to take care of everybody. He acknowledges her and does that. Which again, that sort of makes me believe that it's still going to be that first thing. That she, he's still just uncomfortable that Rudius left Edis. That's simply it. He doesn't, he doesn't hate Sylphie. But what if he's just sort of saying it just to appease Rudius, but he still doesn't trust her. Now again, another thing that breaks this theory completely is that if Rajurd seen something in Sylphie, something dangerous, something that made him uncomfortable, he sensed a presence in her a presence he's familiar with. Why would he leave? He would not leave. He would still, st he'd probably stay there in the shadows watching to see if something happens to Aisha or Norn. Yeah, he probably thinks that Rudius is old enough that he's not considered a child. He sort of already kind of indicated that to Rudius in parting the first time. But I think he would want to protect Norn and Aisha. So I think he would say something or at least intervene. Yes, he's terrible with words, but he's terrible with words because he says something and it makes things worse. <laughs> Not that he doesn't say anything at all. But again, just a crazy theory. I don't even think it's true just because there's so many things that kind of push against it. But it was a thought that popped in my head. But anyways, talk to the death. Talk that to death. We're making decent time. I think I could actually do the rest of this volume. Rajard knows the truth. That's all I'm going to say. Side story, the sharpening of fangs. Edis, again, Edis Nyaz in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to do this every time. Edis Nyaz in the chat. Yeah. Edis Nyaz in the chat. Yeah. Uh, every time Edis comes up in a chapter, we're just going to do the Edis Nyaz. <laughs> An hour north of the sword sanctum, Edis Greyrat swung her sword mindlessly. A swing weighed by idle thoughts was meaningless. The swings that mimicked emotions of another was meaningless. If your sword was pure, empty of thought, then each swing would sharpen your skills. How many swings would it take to get her strong enough to reach Orsted? She didn't know. Maybe never. Meaningless thoughts she was supposed to avoid. She wanted to defeat Orsted. But the more she thought about it, the further he got from her. Ghislaine told her once, think. But Edis was bad at thinking. She couldn't produce an answer that satisfied her. Rajur would say, 
do you understand? As he knocked her to the ground over and over again until she got it. She figured it out without using her head, as if they were equals. The sword god's teaching combined both good parts from both people she respected. Just swing your sword without thinking. Don't think, just swing. And when you get tired, then you think. When you're tired of thinking, stand up and swing again. She'd swing, sit, swing, sit, eat, repeat, over, over. She did this at the training hall, but people got in the way. So she then traveled north and practiced there, returning only to sleep. This was her daily life for six whole months. She did understand one thing. Mastering the sword was difficult. When she was younger, she thought sword play was simpler than studying. While still true, sword play suited her more than book learning. It wasn't simple. She'd raise her sword, bring it down, and yet she couldn't get good at it. It should raise faster, strike faster, but never did she achieve her desired speed. She was probably faster than six months ago, but she wasn't as fast as Ghislaine, or Rajurd, or the sword god, or yes, Orsted. She thought about how each fought. How did they move? She tried to imitate their moves, from the fingertips all the way to the shoulders, to all cells in their body. Then she tried to go beyond that, transcend them, but she didn't know how. There was no way she could. She was bad at thinking. Done with thinking, she returned to swinging, but thoughts filled her head again. She wrapped her blistered hands. It hurt, but it wasn't painful. Compared to what happened three years ago at the Red Worm's lower jaw, she felt like she could withstand anything. Pain meant nothing to her, not the pain in her hand or her frustration, not even the fact that she was by herself now, without him by her side. She breathed out the name, Rudius. She didn't think about it any further. She was bad at thinking. She also wasn't good at staying positive. The more she thought of it, the more she realized she could break. Three years, she thought she had gotten stronger, but it wasn't enough. This was, again, very painful. <laughs> it still remains painful to me. Personally, the idea of Edis doing all this and it's for nothing, at least in the sake of her returning again, going back to marrying Rudius like she planned on. The thing that she left behind that essentially burnt because she didn't realize she left a light on the, a candle lit on the table. And by the time she gets back, it's going to, the whole house is burnt down. And it hurts to really kind of, what I'm sort of getting is that, yes, technically with Edis' chapter, we got so much clarity to Edis as a character and the insecurities that she had and what drove her to follow Rudius so diligently, what caused her to train so much. It wasn't so much the desire to get stronger and stronger and stronger and that she just wanted to be strong. She did not want to be a burden, get left behind. But there's still this sense of, kind of like with Zenoba or kind of like other characters where you have this... This, this thought that these characters are so single-mindedly and dumb. And I think what they're kind of doing right now with what Rajard said and what this chapter specifically is doing is it's almost paying this different perspective of somebody who is admittedly struggling with understanding their situation and understanding how to communicate and understanding what is wrong with things around her. At the same time, still showing that deep inside there, there's a breaking happening. She's sort of breaking right now. I can't think of Rudius. I can't think of it any further because I'm going to break. I've been without Rudy these last three years. And right now I'm training relentlessly and I'm not seeing anything from it. It almost makes you feel like the anger that she has coming up and the anger that she's sort of developing is because she feels like I left Rudius because I need to get stronger. I'm going here to get stronger. I'm not getting stronger. I'm wasting all this time away from Rudy, who I love, and suddenly I'm realizing it's all for nothing. I've wasted all this time and I'm not with him, and it sucks. It's very, very heartbreaking in a sense of a, a character that, again, she herself thinks that she's just not good at thinking. And as Rudy Reserve sort of mentions, she's not good at talking. It's just somebody that's not good at communication, no matter how you spell it out. Which again is sort of similar to pretty much everybody else that Rudius gets <laughs> together with. Sylphie sucks at communication too. Every Rudius sucks at communication. Everybody sucks at communication. Heading back to the training hall, she was greeted by a man. I am the North. Move. She glared at him like an aggressive beast. Or devil. <laughs> Murderous intent swelled up from her 
like an all-consuming blaze. What? The man immediately drew his sword. You're in my way. She stepped towards him as she spoke. He was nothing but an obstacle to her. What in the world is this creature? He couldn't understand her. All she was was a starving beast looking for a meal. She drew her blade before he realized she was human. You may refer to me as Abba, the peacock blade. I see you are a student of the sword god style. Might I request you to guide me to meet the sword god? I told you to move. Realizing that talking was pointless, he drew his other shorter blade, brandishing the flat side at her. She used Sword of Light, but he brushed off the attack, anticipating that she swung her blade back in the opposite direction. But Auber stopped it with his left blade. Despite using both hands, he deflected it easily with one. She followed the momentum of her blade, causing her to stumble on her pivoting foot. He swung his right hand down at her exposed neck, but she discarded her sword and crouched. He kicked her sword away and she tried to go on the offense with her fist but he slammed the blunt end of his sword on her cheekbone, shattering it. Not stopping, she swung at his jaw. As he came down to swing down on her, she grabbed his hand. Her fingers hooked around the hilt as she grumbled. He felt a chill running down his spine as she tried to steal his sword. I just so badly want to see this animated and they do not hold back on any of this animation. I could just envision this, like just the... Anger in her fingers just going, I'm going to take this from you. And he's going, she's going to kill me if I don't do something. Is so cool. This beast wouldn't stop until it was killed. He kicked her away and turned his blade around from the blunt end to the sharp end. They both knew they had to kill their opponent. As she picked up her sword, Auber emitted a murderous intent of his own. But then a voice cut in. That's enough. The sword god appeared from the entrance. They suddenly both stopped. Edis flopped on her back in frustration, and Auber bowed his head to the sword god. It has been a long time, master sword god. So you came, North Emperor. I read your letter, and then the god attacked me. Ah, incredible, isn't she? <laughs> ah, yeah, that thing. <laughs> That's why I sent the letter to you, isn't she great? <laughs> it was the first time I ever seen a sword fighter that relentless. She was almost like a beast. Ah. So, this is the child they refer to as the Mad Dog. Edis listened to the conversation as she stood, grabbed her sword, and drifted inside. Auber readied his sword once again as she walked by, <laughs> but she just glowered at him and entered. After disappearing inside, she sagged down on her hard bed and fell asleep, frustrated at her loss. But it was a trivial matter. It is like so annoying, she's like so frustrated, she comes here and she's just full of venting anger and stuff, and then just like, oh this thing's in front of me, I gotta beat it up, and then it's like, I'm screwed up again. I got beat up again. The mad dog got put down by Auber. The peacock blade. I don't even know what I'm gonna do with his voice. I kind of went from like British to, I don't know, like like he's got a little bit of a, a flavor to him, like a, a tasty peach, I don't know. That evening, Ghislaine visited the ephemeral hall. There was seated sword god Galfalion and North Emperor Auber. Master, why aren't you teaching Edis anything? Already did, didn't I? How to swing her sword, you mean? No, how to temper herself. You always said it yourself. Do everything logically. I did. So what are you doing with Edis? She's out there swinging her sword every day like an idiot who doesn't know anything else. What part of that is logical? Since when did you become such a nag? Since before I came back here. So, you ain't gonna listen to what your master tells you anymore. He drew his sword before she could say anything. Normally, most people wouldn't even see it coming. Ghislaine did see him draw his sword, but it was no time for her to react. In the face of the fastest man in the world, no one could. Except for Orsted, I would assume. <laughs> Except for Orsted, I would assume. Ghislaine, you know, I kind of regret the way I taught you. You used to be such a starved tiger. But now you're like a kitten that's lost its fangs. If you'd stay the way you were, you'd be a sword emperor by now. She swallowed hard at his words. But she did feel like she'd gotten weaker. But it wasn't all bad. Her growth stagnated in the sword. But she gained important things. Intelligence and wisdom. The things she wouldn't have gotten mastering the sword. Again, this is the big shift in her is that she went out and adventured. She eventually realized that she needed to learn more things. And she went over here, took care of Edis, then started studying under Rudius. She's learned so much and, you know, made bonds that she probably never would have. There's sort of that difficulty that they kind of emphasize here and there in the story. This idea of strength versus relationships and bonds. I'm not gonna let Edis lose her fangs too. He put away his sword as if to say, now you understand, don't you? It almost sounds, 
I don't know. I'm I'm totally going on a wild tangent here, but that almost sounds like a reserved comment. Again, like the whole thing with Edis when he was training her. Do you understand? Do you understand? <laughs> Do you understand? Did the sword god meet reserved at some point? Mm, I think I think this is hinting at that. It seems it seems way too well. Again, he's not saying. Do you understand? Don't you? He's literally saying. It, it, the way that it's spelled out here is it's saying he put away his sword as if to say, you understand now, don't you? He didn't vocalize that. It's just, it's just a funny thought. Are we dropping hints, Refugian? <laughs> I don't understand. Why don't you have her train? He sighed, knowing that Ghislaine was the type of child that need thorough explanation. Listen, if someone wants to get better than me, they gotta be able to figure out things out for themselves. That was how I got to where I am. After all, of course, they'll need the requisite amount of talent and hard work to deserve the title Sword God. But let's leave that aside. Edis' objective is the Dragon God Orsted. His existence defies logic. He's a monster beyond imagination. She cannot beat him with my teaching alone. He had a nostalgic look in his face after he finished speaking. He fought the Dragon God himself before he was called the Sword God. He was just as strong, yet he was an arrogant sword saint at the time. He lost miserably but yet was spared, limbs intact. Having his ego beaten from him, he made surpassing Orsted his goal. He's just like Edis. That's why he chose Edis. She's just like him. He trained ever since then. That's how he became the Sword God. That was also exactly why he didn't want anyone else butting their heads into this matter. Again, I think it's emphasizing that this matter with Edis, he wants Edis. I almost wonder if he wants Edis. Here's the question mark. Here's the question mark that I have. And again, I don't need the answer chat. My question mark here is what route are we taking here? The sword God wants to train Edis to basically do what he never could. Or does he want to train Edis to be his partner to defeat Orsted? I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of one of those pride things. Like is is pride so much in his mind that he wouldn't be willing to take Edis with him? Or is he like, I don't care how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna bring whatever I can. I want to just beat him. I don't care if I use Edis to do it. Or again, is it, she's just like me. I wanna make it that that she succeeds where I failed. Curious question. Hey, Ghislaine, doing drills is the same thing as training, you know? Especially if you have something you're aiming for. There's no point in acting like an obedient dog and doing whatever someone tells you. You get it? Master, you always say such complicated things. I don't understand. Ha. Huh. In other words, it means just learning from me won't do her any good. That's why I've prepared a bunch of stuff for her. Beginning with him. He gestured to Aber. I'm North Emperor Abba Cobbett. On the streets, they refer to me as the Peacock Blade. Ghislaine screwed up her face. He had a stench wafting from him. Something powerful, citrusy. Some sort of cologne. Something unpleasant for a beast folk like her. And what is someone from the North God style doing here? Responding to Sword God's request and instructing one of his pupils. Why is someone from the North God style? I don't see how their underhanded tactics would suit Edis. I think otherwise. <laughs> I think otherwise. I think otherwise. She's the one that would be so willing to grab a clump of dirt and slap it in somebody's face. Kick the crap out of somebody's nards. She, she knows how to play dirty. It was simple. The Dragon God would use those against Edis. The idea was that the Dragon God knew all schools of sword fighting. She had to be on equal footing with him. And with that, he would be summoning someone of the Water God style too. She, he's basically giving her a full complete kit. Let's just train everything. Finally, Ghislaine understood. With that, she paid respect to the North Emperor. And thus, Edis's training moved on to its next stage. A year later, she would be recognized as a North Saint. <laughs> okay. Edis is just leveling up. <laughs> She's just leveling up. She's going down all the tree branches, all the talent trees. Let's just get this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. A full arsenal. And again, it makes sense. He fought Orsted before. He knows full well that Orsted knows all of the fighting schools and knows that he will use it on Edis. She has to be able to counter whatever he uses and then she will have a full arsenal to use against him. Being on equal footing will at least give her the advantage that it's gonna come down to who uses what. 
Not that he uses something that she's not aware of and gets caught off guard. Now it's interesting that they're going the route of the idea that her just becoming a saint in each one of them, when I would assume that he would need to become even higher than that, is said that he fought against Orsted when he was known as a saint. Not that he was a sword god at the time, but he does mention specifically that he was the power that he was now. Specifically, it says he was as strong, but yet he was an arrogant sword saint. So he had the skill and the potential, just he wasn't referred to it as that. But it might also be implying the idea that he was strong, but he wasn't skilled. And that's when he started training himself and he got to the point where he became the sword god. But it is interesting. I, I kind of wonder if this is kind of indicating this direction of taking Edis where she comes, becomes emperor of everything. Or maybe even divine. Who knows? <laughs> um, cool stuff, though. Um, interesting direction to take her. We'll see how Auber is. He seems he seems interesting. He doesn't seem like a jerk. He just seems like a cool dude. So hopefully he's a pretty solid character that we'll see in the future. We'll be curious if, to meet somebody of the water god style and who that might be. If it might be somebody that we know. or I don't think that we've met anybody that's water god style at this point. But yeah. As per usual, Edis chapter is always really interesting. I Again, like I kind of got into earlier, I, I kind of want to see... This writer is so good at developing magic and how magic works and how it's developed. And I almost feel like we haven't quite seen that from the perspective of swords fighters. We haven't seen how it develops and how it builds. We obviously get an indication that battle aura is very important as it enhances not just the body, but gives them protections and everything. So my assumption is that there's eventually going to... We've already kind of established that Edis has been developing that. But to what extent is the question mark. But it's going to be interesting to see if possibly, just like with magic, this writer will get to this point, at least maybe through perspective of Edis, of that clicking point where you go, oh, that makes perfect sense. That, that makes perfect sense why this is the developing point going forward. Again, it seems like right now his focus is to temper her. Focus her on doing this one thing over and over again to temper her. And then we'll bring in all these people to train her in different styles. And then we'll go to the next step after that. Now, the curious thing is, is he doing this? Is he bringing all these different schools in to train her in multiple things? Because he knows from his perspective, I came in there, fought them, failed because he knew all the skills. So I want to equip her with what I didn't have. And the final chapter, extra chapter, the master babysitter. <laughs> Approximately one year before Brutus received the letter from Paul, Paul's group arrived in Eastport. They had already discovered Zenith was at the labyrinth city of Erpon on the Begaret continent. And of course, Paul was concerned at the time about taking his two daughters. Begaret was full of roaming monsters in vast numbers. It was said to be as dangerous as the demon continent. He was skilled and yes, there was Talhan and Roxy, but two children coming with them would be difficult. So he decided that he would send the two girls off to Rudius. As he sat at the dining table in the end with Lilia, Norn, Aisha, and Roxy. <laughs> Roxy's in the room. Roxy was noted. <laughs> Roxy, Roxy, my love, I missed you. Roxy, my beloved, I missed her so much. It's been four long volumes of no mention of Roxy in presence, and I finally see my Roxy. I'm like Rudius, it's Roxy, I miss my Roxy. <laughs> I'm talking like Zenoba now. Roxy, I missed you, master. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I've, I've been hurting for four whole volumes, waiting for the moment that she just appears somewhere, and she still exists to this writer. It's been hurting. And again, that kind of, that extends to every one of these characters that we've been kind of so swept up away from this whole time. Again, volume seven was all isolation. It's just Rudeus, you know, Elise comes in at some point, we meet a new group. It's isolation. All the way through 8 and 9, we meet other characters that are fantastic, like Body Gotti. Well, technically we met Body Gotti before then. It's just he shows up. We meet Body Gotti. Ellen Lace is there. We meet Cliff again. We meet Zenoba again. These characters that are there, great. But it is all these other side characters that I just miss so much. I miss Aisha, miss Norn, I miss Paul, miss Lilia, miss Zenith, miss Roxy, Talhand, all these other characters, and yes, Rajurd, 
all these characters I've grown to love just feels like they're so distant. And then finally, <laughs> finally, we get to see them again. It's just, and again, mainly Roxy. Just, I'm sorry, Roxy. I'm, I, I love her. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, I do love her. I'm sorry. Just like all the Sylphie fans were super happy that Fitz was Sylphie, I'm sure. Um, just like all the fans for Edis, Mad Dog chapter comes out and suddenly like, hey, she still lives. Um, it it's it sucks because you grow so attached to these characters and you just have these long periods of not seeing them. It just sucks. But Roxy, my Roxy, my Roxy, I love her so much. As he sat there at the dining table in the inn with Lilia, Norn, Aisha, and Roxy, their plans were debated. Norn obviously sulking and against it, wanting to go with her father. Aisha and Norn bumped heads about the subject. Yes, on the opposite end, Aisha was excited. The moment she heard that she's gonna go meet Rudius, she pumped her fist in excitement. Norn at this point is being selfish. And Aisha really technically had no problems with selfish demands, but she felt Norn had to go about it more intelligently. She had to do it in a way that made others think that they had won. This is how Aisha thinks. Instead, Aisha grew irritable watching Norn repeat, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna. You just don't wanna stay with our big brother, huh? You're treating him like he's some sort of awful person just because he had a little fight with father a long time ago. Even father himself said he was in the wrong. He wasn't. Norn had no doubt it was Rius' fault. She wouldn't accept anything else. You're always like that. As soon as things aren't going your way, you start pouting and whining. You wait until everyone around you gives in. And if anyone says anything you don't like, you yell at them. How idiotic. All Norn could do was glare at Aisha. Tears spreading in her eyes. Lilia spoke up. Aisha, how dare you speak that way? I apologize immediately. This was a daily occurrence. Paul, more or less, had given up on mediating, but he would step in to scold Aisha if she started spouting way too many foul words. It's so sad. He's gotten to the point where he's just not even <laughs> doing anything. He's just this <laughs> bad father. <laughs> Paul's a dirtbag as usual. I was, I was defending him with a letter and here he's just standing up by and just letting it happen. Well, they are sisters, so they're going to fight. Roxy was sitting beside them, looking a bit uncomfortable at the exchange. She knew Lilia well, but that didn't make this an easy place for her to be right now. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, Miss Norn, for getting carried away. Lilia honestly wanted to press her daughter to pay more respect to the daughter of Paul's legitimate wife but didn't know how to convey it properly. She also did feel that Aisha was right this time. <laughs> that is an interesting aspect there, that, which does technically make sense. She was raising Aisha to be a maid just like she was, again, still acknowledging the fact that Paul is her master and that her daughter, despite the fact that it's from Paul, is still technically makes, this all technically makes Norn in a hierarchy higher than Aisha. And so she should be respecting Norn. Delia assured Norn that Master, Paul, would act to ensure her safety. The bigger continent was obviously too dangerous for her. Norn knew that that meant that she would be in the way, but that didn't matter to her. For her, being with father was the safest place for her to be. No one else would be able to protect her. She couldn't leave his side. Again, technically with the whole displacement incident, she's been clinging to him the whole time, afraid alone. This is the person that's been protecting me. He, she has become so reliant on him, she can't separate from him. She slammed her hands down the table, dropping the plate to the floor and scattering all of her food. I want to go with him to where my mother is. You're going with him too, Miss Lilia. That's not fair. Miss Norn, that enough is enough. Be reasonable. Lilia's voice grew louder. She knew her place in the master-servant relationship and cared deeply for Norn, but she knew when it was time to discipline her. Norn flinched but then glared, bawling her fists. I've had enough. She kicked her chair over and dashed out of the dining room. Lilia and Roxy tried to get up to go stop her, but she quickly disappeared in the crowd. Norn ran through the mass of people, eyes full with tears. She was frustrated and felt pathetic. It wasn't the first time things didn't go her way. They rarely did, but she wanted to stay with Paul. She's withstood every outrageous thing that's happened to them all this time, just because she was with him. Ever since the displacement incident, she thought being with Paul was her right. Now, they were trying to steal even that from her. Again, she's lost everything, displaced, had father. That's all she had. And she's dealt with all this crappy stuff that they've gone through, everything. 
And she always kept to herself, kept quiet, accepted it, accepted it, accepted it, wanted things, but never wanted to speak up. Now, this one thing she has left is being taken from her. And she's being told to go to somebody that she thinks is the most horrible person in the world because he attacked the one thing she had. It makes sense from a child's perspective. It makes sense. She turned a corner and collided with a man. Angered because she caused him to drop his skewer, his face turned red. He grabbed her by the collar and hoisted her into the air. His breath stunk of alcohol. <laughs> Here it is, continuing this alcohol thing. She knew well what drunk people did. Watching Paul drink while running from his problems. Although Paul's anger was never directed at her. It was enough for Norn to understand drunk people were terrifying. Drinking is bad. Norn did accept that Paul couldn't function without his liquor, but her father was the only exception. That's what I mentioned earlier. Only Paul's allowed. <laughs> Everybody else, Paul's terrifying. All drunk people are terrifying to her. Drinking's bad, but at least he never directed it at her and she knew that he needed to do it to cope with his issues. But again, that goes with the whole thing with Rudius. The moment she knew that he drinks, He's bad. It was the worst first impression for her to reunite with her brother. Like, you almost think that she had a moment where she's like, okay, maybe he's not that bad. I should really like him. Maybe he's not that bad. Goes up there. No, he's bad. <laughs> he's bad. And he's with somebody else. As the man demanded compensation, all Norn could do was sob at his intimidation, struggling to hold back an overwhelming terror that threatened her to wet herself. She apologized, but the man demanded to see her parents. Everyone passed by, not getting involved. Until one man, <laughs> Papa Richard, <laughs> his face immediately turned to anger. He rushed up, grabbed the man's arm. Despite this man having these large arms, he grabbed it with one hand and twisted it back with no resistance at all. The drunkard quickly released his grip on Norn, causing her to fall on her butt. Explain, just what did this girl do to you? At this point, Norn didn't recognize Richard, but she still rushed to hide behind him. Th 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 that little brat just ran into me out of nowhere, and now my shirt- She apologized. That apology isn't going to get the stain out. Ouch! He strengthened his grip on the man's arm. One of the drunkard men tried to grab at Richard's face, but missed, and slightly brushed his headband. Give up on the stain or give up on living. What will it be? The man apologized in pain before Richard told Norn to apologize again. After doing so, the man fled. As Richard asked if she was okay, Norn looked up to realize who he was. Back when she was in Milshin, she almost tripped and he extended his hand to help her. Here's where we're finally revealing that yes, he was the one that gave her the apple. <laughs> Gently, he patted her on the head and gave her an apple. There was no way that she could forget him. Bald man, forehead protector, and a large scar on his face. The relief broke the floodgates and she began to cry. Richard panicked at this as passerbys were staring. He knelt down and stroked her head. The warmth of his hand and the way that he handled her as gently as a porcelain brought her comfort. After this, Norm vented about the fact that she was being told that she'd be in the way. Assuming it was an issue between her and Paul, Richard heard her out, knowing that he was only getting one side of the story, of course. But yes, he could understand her desire to be with her father. But being a father himself, he had once left his family behind. Not because they were in the way, but because he wanted them to be safe. When he left his village at the beginning of the war, his son's tail was still attached to his body. Again, to remind people, tail, at some point, stiffens up, falls off, becomes their spear. Richard fought in Laplace's personal guard for many years. As he won battles, they began to unify the demon continent. During this time, his son grew. His tail became a spear, his body muscular, and he became a magnificent young man. He grew enough that when Richard returned to his village for the last time, this is the part that hurts, the last time that he returned before everything went bad, his son approached him arrogantly insisting that he was an adult and to take him to his next battle. Knowing he wouldn't listen, Richard used his strength to force him to back down. If this is all you're capable of, then you're not a warrior yet in my eyes. Oof. <laughs> it was common mindset for warriors to keep their loved ones from battle to protect them. In the end, his son was a true warrior, not him. Oof. His son defeated Richard when the demonic spear made him go berserk. It was his son that saved the other warriors. Noting right here that his son broke the spear, snapped him out of it, despite the fact that his son died in his hands, he was the one, not Richard when he went around and broke all the spears, it was because of him, he saved them. 
he still at this point did not know how his son defeated him. Rajard had roamed the demon continent carrying that question, but never found a satisfying answer. However, he had one idea now. His son grew stronger in ways his father never knew about. And I wonder right here if this is something that Rudius taught him. Because again, Rudius changed his perspective on everything, re-pivoted him, and showed him that he was thinking things through wrongly. Gave him a different vantage point. And I think he's this is something he knows now because of his experience with Brutius. He followed his father's instructions and trained himself with purpose and determination in order to protect both his mother and the village. Richard felt so much pride. If Norn felt the same way, she would never listen. No matter how much Paul told her, he was worried about her and that she was precious to him. If only she was older, stronger, or had the same purpose to spend her days training. If she was capable as Rudius, then Rajard would have tried to persuade Paul to take her. And this is that sad thing, which I think might be a good growing point for Norn, is I think with like here and with several times later, it's sort of indicating this idea that Rajard is trying to instill upon Norn, you need to get stronger. If you want to walk at their side, you need to get stronger. If you want to go to the beggar at continent, you need to get stronger. You can't keep crying and saying, just take me with you and protect me. You can't all the time. If you wanna go with them, you have to get stronger. His son did that. She would have to do that too. So I'm curious if that will be a turning point for Norn to somehow, I'm sorry, I should have triggered warning, <laughs> a changing point for Norn to get stronger. It could surprise me that Norn has something about her that's specifically unique. Maybe that she takes more to Zenith, so she's more capable of becoming a healer. Does she have something in her that would make her a strong swordswoman or something? I think it's probably, again, going to go probably to a cleric healer or something like that. But it's still a curious question. She's technically already losing out on that capability of learning early and building her mana pool like Rudius did. But yes, Norn was young and frail. Norn, you need to get stronger. If you want to be with someone, you have to get bigger stronger, more impressive. In order to get there, you're going to have to bear with your circumstances right now. Despite the fact that he was so clumsy in conveying his thoughts, she understood. It was simple. I think it was, a, it was a simple thing, but yes, like it's saying here, it was probably perhaps the fact that his words, unlike with Lilia and Aisha, came with positivity. He basically said, you can do this, but you have to get stronger. You can do this, but not now. Future. Change yourself. She gave an ugh as she looked downwards. Rajard responded with a smile and stroked her head. Papa Rajard is so good. <laughs> He's so good. He's so simple. It makes sense. He's positive. He's had experience. He knows what to say at this point, especially again after everything he's learned being with Rudius. Don't worry. I'll protect you in your father's stead until you get there. This is where he's pretty much already decided. This is the funny thing because like in a minute, he'll walk away. He goes to walk away in a minute until Roxy shows up. And I almost feel like <laughs> this is the point where he's literally saying, all right, I'll protect you. But he was probably gonna protect her from a distance. I think he was planning on just watching and then jumping in to protect her. Just like he was sort of gonna do with Rudius if it weren't for the fact that Rudius accepted his help. He was gonna stand by and watch Rudius walk all the way over there. Okay, he started to lift his hand away. Ah, what is it? Please pet my head a little longer. <laughs> he obliged. It feels kind of comforting. I see. It's so cute. I want to see this animated. And again, it's an extra chapter, so it's probably not going to be. They continued as folks passed by at the pleasant sight. Norn's face eventually turned to a smile. Then Roxy yelled out. Ah, there she is. Miss Lilia, I found her. Looks like they're here for you. He turned to leave as Nord called out for him. Please tell me your name. His headband loosened and became undone, revealing his gem. Reserved. Reserved Superdia. It was straight out of a fantasy novel. <laughs> this is like the Doki Doki's hit Norn. She's falling in love with Rajard. <laughs> Are we shipping Rajard and Norn? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm currently not seeing this. It was straight out of a fantasy novel. Man with a beautiful jewel on his forehead, illuminated by sunlight from behind. In that moment, Norn felt like a fairy tale princess whose knight came to rescue her. At the same time, Rajard made another completely different impact on another girl, <laughs> Roxy Magurdia. 
To describe the gravity of this impact would require some explanation. There was three things that Roxy hated as a child. The first was green peppers. The first, <laughs> the first vegetable she ate after arriving on the male's continent. At the time, she thought the human world was a heaven full of sweets. And the green peppers had been the messenger from hell sent to drag her into the abyss. <laughs> she remembered the scent and the bitter taste, how she immediately spat it out. The, the extra chapters are so freaking funny. It's just so comical funny. She thought it was a poison to the Migur tribe. Though, yes, she did overcome it while tutoring Rudius. She was embarrassed at the thought of being picky about food in front of him. Second thing she hated was children. <laughs> this is sort of a negative for me on Roxy. I was like, oh no, she's got a negative. She corrects it. Human children between 5 and 15 specifically, especially males. They didn't listen, act hastily, and based on whims, not heeding logic. Rudius changed this though, and she figures she just hated people who didn't listen. Okay, so she corrected paths, but still, this is like most children. It's not, Rudius is not most children. In a way, yes, she conquered her hatred of children as well. Third thing she hated was the Superb tribe. <laughs> she heard countless stories of them when she was a baby. Devilish tribe involved in the war before she was born and betrayed their allies. The Megar tribe had connections to them in the past, but they were persecuted as traitors and driven to ruin. The Superd held a strong grudge against those who turned against them. As soon as they spotted a demon from another tribe, they killed them without question. Of the Superd, Dead End was best known amongst children. If children misbehaved, he dragged them into his lair, eat their legs so they can't run, eat their arms so they couldn't resist, and then slowly eat their stomachs, saving their head for last so they stayed fresh. That's why you had to be well behaved. <laughs> it's such a screwed up story. The stories in this world are screwed up so bad. Now, granted, a lot of these are kind of similar to like stories here, but it's still, they're screwed up. When Roxy first left the village, she thought that she was in danger of being ill behaved. But the anxiety left her as she grew to an adult. But fear of the superb tribe remained. That's why she was on high alert when someone called themselves Dead End at Windport. Now again, that same person she spotted at Windport was here, Jewel exposed. And he was about to sink his teeth into Norn. Fear gripped Roxy, shivers raced through her body. She felt that she might lose consciousness right then and there. But she was entrusted with protecting Norn. Lilia was springing to them, Aisha, was at the inn. No, not just them. Everyone in the plaza was in danger. <laughs> Roxy's heart screamed at her, forcing her to still herself. Let go of that girl. If you refuse, I shall be your opponent. As Lauren clung to Rajard, she felt something was off, but her anxiety stopped her from figuring out what that was. Still, she had the feeling she was making a mistake. She knew the feeling too well. Lilia called out, Lord Rajard, it's been a while. Roxy gave up. You know him? Haven't you heard? Lord Brazier was the one that escorted Lord Rudius back to the Ashra Kingdom. Yes, she had heard that Dead End escorted him, but she thought it was a lie. She didn't think it was actually a superb. Realizing that she had made a mistake, Roxy turned her face away bright red. She really did hate the superb tribe. <laughs> That's your own fault, Roxy. That was your own fault. But yes, after this whole thing, they had mixed reactions about Brazier escorting them. Lily and Ginger was fine. They they knew well of his character and his strength. Viera and Cher... They said Cher again. <laughs> Seven C is the second Cher in this volume. I want you to send me a revised version. <laughs> Seven C's. Talham was against it. Like Roxy, he grew up hearing these scary stories about the Superb tribe. But it extended further and Talhan knew that no smoke was without fire. He knew full well that Rajard had done something terrible in his past. So the aspect that, yeah, he's a good person now, but he still did something terrible in the past. Even if he was on the path of redemption now, didn't mean that they can trust him with loved ones. Roxy, on the other hand, was partly against it, knowing full well that she couldn't judge people based on appearance or preconceived notions. It was a superb they were talking about. Even if he didn't present any danger, she remained cautious. Rather, she was afraid. <laughs> Even if the McGurdian tribe no longer told those stories, it was a common way of disciplining children. So she finally decided, if you really think you can trust him, then go ahead. Paul debated it for a little bit. Yes, last time he met Rajard, he seemed trustworthy, but years can change a person. Something he knew from personal experience. <laughs> yes, all the things that's happened to Paul ever since the displacement incident, dude's changed a lot and several times. As he debated, he noticed Norn clinging on Rajard's leg. For a moment, he seemed double, an image of himself with Norn clinging on his leg. 
Norm was so shy to people she hadn't warmed up to. Despite that, she leaned against Richard as if he were her father. Richard saved Norn. As she was desperate for help, he stepped in as if it was his duty. Richard did the same thing for Rudius. Most likely, he hadn't changed. Because he's a good boy. Richard's a good boy. <laughs> Can I trust you with them? Even if it costs me my life, I will deliver them to Rudius. He had duty and determination in his eyes. A face of a warrior. One earned over many, many moons. Something Paul himself didn't possess. If it was deception, Paul didn't know what real was anymore. Then I leave it to you. With that, they exchanged a firm handshake. Firm handshakes. <laughs> Need the bro, the bro handshake on the screen. Um, and that's it. That's, that's volume 10. It's done. Uh, as per usual, extra chapters are always super good. And again, I always cry because I know they never get adapted. And this will be completely glossed over. Completely. Technically, remember, the anime completely ripped out the situation with Norn getting the apple from Rajerd. Again, Rajerd followed Edis. Now, they technically can explain the idea that as he was following Edis, he noticed Norn falling and caught her and gave the apple and then went follow. But, I don't know. I don't know. He's always hiding in the shadows. He could have not. And so it kind of leads me to believe that even that is not going to transfer over to here. He's still going to escort Norn and Aisha. Don't get me wrong. I think he's still going to escort them. But I think they're going to change it quite a bit. And that's really unfortunate because, like I said, I love, love these extra chapters so much. But, yeah, really good stuff. I, I think the big key things here, obviously, is being just, again, even though I gave Paul so much credit in that letter, he's he's still kind of a dirtbag. <laughs> he's still letting everybody else handle his children. Uh, even though he does care for them in the end. I, I think despite that, he still does truly care for them. He wants them safe. Knows he can't bring them with him. He could be totally reckless and go, eh, just like the Demon Continent. I don't think it's that bad. Ge Geese keeps telling me how dangerous Demon Continent is, but it's not that bad. Beggar, it's not going to be bad. I've seen tough stuff. He hasn't really truly experienced those kind of situations. And the... It, 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 I think Begaret's going to be a huge wake-up call for him. Now, I still think he's an incredible warrior, and he's seen a lot of incredible battles, but not to the levels of Demon Continent or Begaret. Geese even told him that. You don't know what you're walking into. The Demon Continent is dangerous. And again, it's going to be similar in Begaret. I think they sort of implied at some point that Begaret was a little bit less dangerous than Demon Continent. Like, Demon Continent was the worst. But they're still, like, even in here, they're implying that they're the same. At least somewhere in here, in this volume, they imply that they're the same. So yes, he does care for them. He wants them safe. And yes, he's struggling with the fact that, yeah, he, he acknowledges that she's attached to him. He said it in the letter to Rudius. Norn's just, I spoiled her. <laughs> like, I literally spoiled her. Not that it was a bad thing. I mean, he wanted Norn to look up to him as the greatest. But he sort of didn't have a choice in the idea that the moment that they arrived in a displacement incident when they got transferred, that changed everything. She became super reliant on him and he was protecting her. But the problem then comes in reverse is the idea that she has become so attached to him because he's everything. She lost everything. A child to lose the stability of a safe home is tragic to him. That she has been completely disheveled from normality, thrown in an unknown area, and all, the only familiar thing that she had to see every second of her days was dad. That's the only thing that I, I, that I can find normality in. I don't know where mom is. I don't know where my family is. Don't even know where Lilia is. Don't know where Aisha is. Don't know where our house is. I don't know where the village is. She completely got ripped from anything normal. And he was the only thing normal. And even he himself was changing. He went it's downhill real fast, and she had to deal with that fact that he was lost, but that she had to accept it because he needs to do this. He obviously, dad's, dad knows best, and he, he needs to do this, so I need to accept it. He never texts me, so it's good, but it still, it scares me. It scares me that he gets in that state, but he needs to do this. He obviously knows better, so I'm going to accept it, but I won't accept anybody else doing it. That's the big turning point for her. Sorry again. 
the big change for her, the big, the big pivot for her. I gotta find a different word for that because everybody gets mad. Uh, it's so interesting to see that perspective. And I, again, I, I, I understood Norn when she was first encountering with Rudius. Didn't like him. I understood because it's a child's mindset. And even if she has gotten older, she hasn't really necessarily matured because she hasn't had a, st a stable place to mature. And so she's kind of got stuck in this one position, which makes me really, honestly, like, I know Aisha. She's fun. Not really excited to see her change. Norn, I'm excited to see what the writer's going to do for Norn. I mean, I'll accept whatever they do with Aisha. Don't get me wrong, but, and I love Aisha, but I'm excited to see what, what this writer has planned for Norn, because again, she's the normal one. Does she just become a normal person, normal grown-up, normal adult, goes on with her life being normal? Or is this, again, with what Rajur, what Rajur said is sticking in my mind. It's totally sticking in my mind. What Rajur said, how is that going to affect her? And again, based on our experience with Rudius, Julie, Sylphie, everybody, and everything that was explained by F Sylphie as Fitz, it makes me assume that Norn doesn't really have many options if she wants to become stronger. She's sort of a little bit too old. I mean, she's, I think she's, I would assume she's probably about seven, I think. Yeah, I think they would probably be about seven. He, he just, in the letter, he mentioned the idea that they're going to be turning, he's going to miss their 10th birthday, which is the assumption because they're, if they're around seven or eight, and this might take a couple of years, he's not going to make it there for the 10th birthday. Again, I'm assuming she's around seven or so. Which makes me believe that they're pretty much at the cusp that they would no longer... They're, she's going overboard in the idea of learning things like silent casting and stuff. She could. If she is just at the cusp of that point, and she goes to Rudius and says, I need to get stronger. I want to be with Father. I want to help him. Teach me. She can probably learn silent casting from Rudius and Sylphie. Learn silent casting of healing. And thus be something. And again, I don't think she's, I think she's a little bit too old possibly for the point of being able to become like a warrior or something. But again, because she's normal. But it does make me kind of wonder, what is the writer's plans for her? Again, to be normal, to become a warrior, to learn battle auras, become stronger as a swordsman. Again, I think she's a little bit too late for that. A caster, I think she's, she's like right there at the cusp. She could possibly learn all that stuff just before getting too old. And again, my assumption is it's probably going to go in the route of possibly her becoming a healer or a cleric, something that can support father and keep him safe and heal him if he gets injured, not probably becoming a, like a, she could do both, but I, I think that's the route they're doing. But again, I think because of what Rajard said, it sort of stuck in my mind that she is going to learn, want to learn how to get stronger. And again, what he said for now, just wait, follow what they tell you, go get stronger. Then come back. And again, I think that's the route they're going to take. So interesting. But yeah, the big key thing is, obviously the big key thing is, Roxy. <laughs> I was so happy to see her. Um, very briefly, unfortunately, just like Rajard. It's like, Rajard and Roxy are like these two that I've just missed so much. Rajard shows up, says a bunch of cool things, disappears. Roxy shows up, Says some goofy things. They have a little brief moment that she disappears. And I probably won't see her again for another two volumes. It, it breaks my heart. Uh, but at least I got a taste of the goddess. That's all that matters. So, But again, that's it. That is Mushoku Tensei Java's Reincarnation Volume 10. So following week we'll be jumping into Volume 11. We'll see where things go. Hopefully Volume 11 is better. I know that... Specifically, my brother is excited for me to get into Volume 11, so that makes me assume that's probably something for Sylphie. <laughs> he loves Sylphie, so obviously there's going to be something in Volume 11 for Sylphie. But yeah, until then, I appreciate you guys as always for dropping by. I'm kind of excited that we got through a whole volume in three Mushoku Mondays, but again, that's because there wasn't too much to dig into with this one. And yes, technically I did. I pushed a little too hard in the last two videos and I really need to chill out. <laughs> like, I, I think I mentioned this in the last Mushiko Monday, but I need to chill out. I am pushing memory cards and time to edit a little bit too far. Plus I'm trying to 
do a little bit more editing in the Mushoku Mondays, partly just to get my skills up in, in the editing software, but partially just to kind of spice things up a little bit. I think it's fun. So we'll see. I, if I'm, again, I might have to tone down, get back to that hour 20, hour 30 mark like I used to and not keep pushing hour 40, hour 50, two hours. <laughs> But I hope you guys enjoy it. Either way, I appreciate you guys so much. Thanks for everybody that dropped by for the premieres. All that leaves comments when the comments are available. Sometimes they aren't because I say something that probably speculates on something or makes somebody mad. And so the com the, the mods say, don't bother. <laughs> Just turn the comments off. But either way, we are on Discord. Make sure to join there. It's in the description. If you want to join the Discord, we have a Mashuka Monday channel where you can talk about currently what we're reading. We also have a spoiler chat thread in the light novel manga uh, channel, which you can jump into and just say whatever you want. Uh, just don't make people angry. Follow the rules. But yes, as per usual, greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate everybody for the support, the kind words, everything means so much to me. And additionally, especially those that support monetarily by supporting the channel through memberships, tips link, super thanks, super chats, all that stuff. It keeps this going. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> bills got to be paid. Um, and so people that do support that way, it, it's greatly appreciated, especially since it's parting with your own hard-earned money to give to this. But I'm glad that my content brings you joy enough that it means value to you. So with that all said, I hope you guys enjoy this Mashuka Mondays. Happy Mashuka Mondays. Have a great rest of your day. And I will see you guys next week. And I thank you all for your support and for dropping by. Until the next Mashuka Mondays, y'all take care. It is hard to, LLA spoke up. It's hard to believe that someone like Silent is the kind, it's a, LLA spoke up. It's kind of hard for me, LLA spoke up. LLA, 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 oh my gosh. Rudy's actually considered enlisting her to help LLA. Rudy's sort of, con, Rudy's considered having, Rudy's considered enlisting her to actually help take LLA, LLA, LLA's gonna take LLA's out. Why is my throat so, like, froggy? <laughs> Probably because you recorded a podcast and then did a live stream, Andrew. Master Cliff, Zenoba, let's just talk about what we came up with yesterday. <laughs> then, Zeno then he, then he explains Zenoba's proposal about, then he, then he explains Zenoba's proposal about multi-layer structures. <laughs> then he explains Zenoba's proposal for multi-layer Why can't I say this part? <laughs> then, then Zenoba proposed, the, then, then he talked about Zenoba's proposal for multi-layer, multi-leveled structures. Nanahoshi listened with disinterest as Rudius showed her correcting circles. Nanahoshi listened with kind of disinterest as Rudius talked about. Nanahoshi listened with disinterest as Rudius talked about all the correction that Cliff kind of proposed on. Nanahoshi list. Nanahoshi listened with disinterest. Nanahoshi listened with disinterest as Rudius kind of went through all the corrections that Cliff proposed. It's a give and take, right? The next time in a bind, it's a give and take, right? The next time in a bind, it's a give and take, right? The next time in a it's an outlook. It's <clears throat> it's an out. It's an it's it it's it's an outlook. It's an outlook. It's an out. It's an outlook. Rudius felt he was so reliable that he would. Rudius felt he, he was. Rudius felt that Reserve was so reliable that he would be even contemplating hiring him to protect. Reserve was so reliable that Rudius Rudius felt that he was so. But still, Rudius was at loss. But still, Rudius was at a loss at what to talk to. As they sat together, Rudius thanked Rajurd for getting the sisters there. So, as they sat there, he did find some items belonging to people believed to be dead. He did end up finding some belongings that he... He did find some belongings to people believed to have been died. <laughs> believed to have died. She's just offer. She's, she's just offering Rajurd and Ginger services. That's just the way things be. That's just the thing. That's just the way things... That's just the way things between men and women. That's just the way of things between men. That's just the way between before smor Rudius then looked at Silphy and Rudius and forced a smile. Perhaps in Rajur's position, he'd be more comfortable seeing him cozy. Perhaps from Ru per perhaps in Rajur's position. Perhaps in Rajur's position. Perhaps in Rajur's position. Position. Why keep it on position? Rajur's position. And yes, new and yes, new and yes, Nor knew what she meant. And yes, knew Nor that she. And yes, Nor knew that. Yeah, I can't do it. Damn it. Damn it. We're gonna go for another recording. I gotta dump the memory card.